This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Try to believe, though the going gets rough, that you got a hang tough to make it. History repeats itself, try and you succeed. Hey, Place to Be Nation, you've made the cut, and so have we, because we're back. Um, Aaron, George, how are you? I am great. It's, I mean, it's frigid. It's frigid as hell up here, you know? It's all right. Dog takes a winter. We're going to break kayfabe. This is JT, by the way. Hi. Um, it's okay. It's been a while. We can admit it. You've grown yeah. a, you grew a gigantic beard and you've shaved it since we've last spoken. It's gone. It yeah. is gone. And I feel like, I feel whole again. You feel whole. I think you'd feel whole with the beard. Would no, you feel naked the, beard, about it? the beard made me a madman. It <laughs> made you a man. Crazy. I would say it made you a man. No, no, no. My children made me men. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so anyway, we're back here, surprisingly enough, still talking about the GWE project. Uh, the endless. And who made the, who made the cut. Um, it is endless. But you know what? If Scott and Nate can still talk about their shitty lists, we can still talk about our good ones. So I think it's fine. Um, it, it's a project, you know, it's an evergreen project, a gift that keeps on giving. People may just be catching up on it now, so it's all right. So we have, like, uh, you know, we're moving through our lists. We're in, like, the <laughs> mid-30s, so we got some time. We're going to tre- see how many we get through tonight. And then once we finally finish this, we can move on to the tag team project. So that's our goal, right? Yeah, at some point in the, the very distant future, we'll get to the tag teams. Yeah, maybe after it's done, but we'll get it there. Um. So anyway, all right. So when we last left you, like six months ago, we were in, like I said, the mid thirties. Our overall list, we have about forty-one guys left to cover. So that's a combo of people you may have had that I didn't have, and on and on. So why don't we start with uh, number forty-one, who on my list was number thirty-three. On yours was number thirty-nine, and that is Chico Tito Santana Arriba. Uh, El so Matador. We, we had them within six of each other, so that's good. So not too yes. far off on our thoughts. Uh, I think some people may have seen this as high, and some people may have seen it as low. So I think we're probably in a good spot, right, for Tito? Do you agree? I would. I, I mean, obviously, we put him there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> um, I, I, I think people are going to – I think there are there is a subset of fans that's not going to be happy that he's not in, like, the top 20 or, right. or yeah. inside the top 30. But, right. but he doesn't deserve to be. No, he doesn't. No. And I love Tito. I I enjoy Tito as well. Yeah. I enjoy his long flowing hair. I love the flying jalapeno. Like I love everything about the man. Right. So what do you love about him? Besides this everything? Well give me some specifics. Specifics? Um it was part of the ta- strike force. And I know that sounds silly at first, yeah. but they were when I started watching wrestling, they were my the first tag team champions that I ever knew. Um so they will always have a special place in my heart. And going back and watching Strike Force, uh, a very underrated team. I know mm-hmm. we're not ta- Wait, are we talking tag teams now? <laughs> no, um well, I, I, yeah, maybe kind of if you're going to get yeah, into that so topic. He's he's part of it. Um right. I, I just think like he's the quintessential solid uh, mid card guy. He ended up stud being muffin. stud muffin, and and you look sexy as hell. All mm-hmm. right, that that Latin heat. He was Eddie Guerrero's Latino heat fifteen years early, and sure. man, would he have made an excellent member of the LWO yeah. Chico Santana. Um, I, I just think he was he's excellent. He's just all around excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, his teams are great. His singles work is great. I think he's got the best match at WrestleMania two with JYD against the Funks, which I know is probably contentious to some. Um, just consistently solid, and I mean, you, you'll never get a bad match out of Tito Santana. Does him so, never having been a heel hurt him in your eyes? No, because it, I, I didn't want to see him be a heel. No, I, Did you? No, no. He's a tremendous face. So overall, he finished at um, 28, so a little higher oh, wow. than we have him. Uh, he actually yeah. had a high vote of five. That feels high. Yeah, that, that that's <laughs> that is high. <laughs> you're, you're you're putting him ahead of either Hogan, uh, Cena. I can tell you right here. Austin. Yeah, yeah, he was ahead of Austin on this guy's list. Dean Cole, our buddy right. Dean Cole's had him higher than Austin. So, 
Well, um, Dean, I wish uh, I wish I held your optimism for Tito Santana. <laughs> I mean, he is great. Depends what you're looking for in criteria, right? So, I mean, if I, if you're going to rank Tito that high, you are not. You're basically saying you don't care as much, probably, about like main eventing, um, jump up moments and matches, like because he is a great <laughs> worker. For, so, if you're if you're highly rating like work rate, you know in-ring capabilities, selling, like, like all that stuff, then, yeah, he's he's probably going to check in quite high for you. Yeah, but... if you give no shits about the system we put forward <laughs> for this project, right. then I can definitely see you having Tito Santana at number five. Right. Yes, that, that's a fair statement right there. Um, because in fairness, like, as good as he is in the ring, like, he's, he's I mean, he's, in, he's a, I guess, a, a serviceable promo. Like, I mean, he... Uh, he was although, good in his day. In the, in the mid-'80s, yeah. he had some good fire, fired-up promos. Yeah, and that feud with Valentine is an all timer, right? Like, oh yeah, one of the greatest feuds of the WWF in the eighties. Oh yeah, it may be the best. I, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever. Non Hogan division, right? <laughs> so um, <laughs> it may be the. It's probably the. Well, you got Slaughter Sheik. Okay, it's one of the best. Um, yeah. So let's, let's revisit our system since it's been a while. So nuance, longevity, he has flexibility. I give it to him because he's got the tag. He didn't have to be a heel to get the flexibility. Intangibles, no. I, he had great charisma and connection with the fans. Like you watch some of those matches, and it is off the charts the way he connects with the fans. Like they are so yeah. into him all the time. Like when he's selling, they're into him. When he's on his fiery comebacks, they're into him. Um, everything he does, he, he had a really good connection with the fans. If you watch the yeah. Saturday Night's main event from uh, 1990 where he fights yes. Mr. Perfect. Oh, what a match. Like, like he's so far from contention at that point, and they're still buying everything he's doing. Right. Oh, yeah. He had so much built-in cred as a just a, a star that it was believable. And that, that's a tremendous match. I mean, that might be the match of the year for, for WF90, depending on how you feel about the ultimate challenge. Um, well, how do you feel about uh, Boss Man and uh, Jake the Snake? Did they fight in 1990? Didn't they have that rat match at Sir, Sir SummerSlam? That was Bad News Brown and Jake. Boston was the referee. I, oh, God. That's who I meant. I meant Bad News. I'm out yeah. of practice. It's been too long. It's been a while. Okay? It's, it's hot here. It's weird, right? Like, <laughs> you used to podcasting in the cold. I know. Cold in I my know. basement. <laughs> um, In a different house. <laughs> I've moved. I've literally moved since the last time we talked. You might have been in the new house the last time. I remember you were like hiding there, like you had it was it, it was there, but you weren't like fully moved in or something. So no, I had to go back to the old house because the internet was still there. That's right. That's what it was. Um. All right. So anyway, jump up factor is where we're agreeing he probably lacks a bit, but he does have some big ones. Like he's got, like you said, it's probably one of the best storylines. He also has the strike force breakup, which is really memorable. Um, do you think? Do you think he's hurt a bit that they never? I mean, they, they never had that huge blow off at a big pay per view. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, they do get a bunch of them here and there, but yes, they never had the big singles match. Um, like, so why the hell don't they fight at WrestleMania six? Yeah, that didn't make sense. Um, but then they did have a plan for SummerSlam ninety, and Martel had to take the time off. I think his wife was sick or something, and that's why you get Tito Warlord. They were supposed to fight at that show. I thought he had a modeling contract. Well, that too. He was in France, so. Um, but anyway, he they would have had it. I I think too. Part of it is like his later years are are just kind of, you know, he dips in the El Matador stuff and everything else. So, I, you know, if you only remember that and you're not like up on the mid 80s Tito or the early 80s Tito, that might hurt a little bit in your voting. Um, yeah, he might not make your list if right. all you know is El Matador. And... But the thing is, too, if you watch like some of that stuff, like he was still um, putting on good matches. Like Sean at eight is like solid. You know, his match mm -hmm. with, uh, is it Flair like on that? European tour or whatever. Um, yeah. Doesn't good. he beat The Undertaker? Well, he he <laughs> wrestles was... The Undertaker. Did he, beat, did he beat him? Actually, he might have beaten him in that match in Spain <laughs> or whatever. Um, he also has that fun match with Coco where Coco's the heel at MSG. <laughs> Not if you've ever seen that one. Um, <laughs> that's pretty fun. But, you know, his selling is great. Like WrestleMania 6 you mentioned against the Barbarian. That sell on the clothesline is like fucking top notch. And he does get a little like moment in the sun as Survivor Series 90 in the um, grand finale match. They put him with Hogan. Warner. Yeah. So that's cool. But no, he's. I mean, he's great. I mean, for a guy that never had a world title run or really big world title feud to be even in the 30s, like speaks to how well respected and how good he is. Promo skills fine, character work good, work rate obviously 10 to 10 for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great talent. But again, it just sucks that his push wasn't a little more consistent throughout the late 80s, early 90s. Right. But yeah, the Valentine feud is is fantastic, and the Strike Force breakup is probably his top non Valentine moment. 
And even his feud with Savage is interesting. It's got some nice peaks oh, and valleys. Yeah. And there's a lot of matches at MSG that they had throughout that spring. Like, they fight a few times, and they're all really good. So they had a fun run. I mean, that, that's probably the match. Maybe we should have had a two, you know, instead of Steel Savage, like Tito Savage rematch would have been fun there. Maybe it gets Tito that, that bigger. Because he's in every Mania from one through nine. But he kind of lags a little bit. He finally wins at nine, doesn't he? Yeah, but it's a dark match. <laughs> That's his first win. Um, him and Hogan were the only people in the first nine manias, and Fink, I guess. But he, uh, what was his best mania match? You think the Funk's tag? Um, yeah, pro. I, I really like that match. Like I, I watched eighty the uh, the year of eighty six, maybe about six months ago, and. That was up there in terms of match of the year for me in terms of pay per view matches. Yeah, no, it's it's a damn good one. He, uh, I'm trying to think what. So you know, one nothing, three. He's in that tag with Danny Davis, which is you know fun, but um, it's fine. Four, actually, the demolition strike force match of four is kind of fun. The brainbusters match is great in its own way, right? That might be that might be better than the funk one, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's up there. It's a memorable overall, and then you get barbarian. Mounty is nothing. Sean's fine. So, yeah, I mean, I would say it's probably one of those two tags is, is his best mania work. So, yeah. all right, Tito, obviously well worth in that slot. We had him similar, and he finished similar. So, all right, let's get to um, another <laughs> uh, contentious man here. <laughs> Might take some time. <laughs> um, you actually had him higher than me, even though you have been on record very notably as disliking him quite a bit. There are men involved in this project and the website and podcast family that uh, are in love with him. And there are men involved with us that really hate him and probably prefer him dead versus being on this list. And that is the game, Triple H. So to level set, he is... Time to play the game! <sighs> it's funny because he is the 40th guy on my list. He is 33 to you. But he's actually the 40th guy on our combined list to talk about as well. <laughs> um, overall, though, he finished at 21 with a high vote of four. Um, Fuck Scott. Scott's the worst. No, I don't think it was Scott, actually. <laughs> no, I know it wasn't. Um, I know it wasn't. Right. Scott actually had – Scott was pretty fair. He had him at um, 12. So, I mean, that's pretty good for Scott, right? That, that show was yeah. pretty good. Uh, you know, and you knew he was doing it through gritted teeth, but he just didn't want to be embarrassed, which, he, you know, should be for other picks, but that one's okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to see who had Triple H at four, but anyway, so it, that, that's high. But I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not when we talked about it, but we'll get into it. Uh, Ray Miller had him at four, whoever that is. Uh, sounds like a guy who has like a jazz band or something, the Ray Miller Five. <laughs> the Ray Miller Five. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I first made this list, in my mind, I pictured Triple H at 40, and he never moved. When I first made my list, he was at 40. And I never budged him because to me, he's inside the top half of the greatest guys they've had, but he shouldn't be a higher, but he's not like at the cut line. So 40 just always felt right to me. Like he feels like a guy and it feels like it'd be a nice slight to him too. Like you get rock awesome. All these guys on the top 10 and triple H you're on the list. You're on the top half, but you're more like a 40 guy. You know, you're more like a B, B player, right? I mean, this is kind of where we're at. So <laughs> It made me feel good that on our combined list he fell at 42, and that's where I had him. 40 as well, I should say, and that's where I had him all along. So I'm going to let you start since you actually had him higher than me. Look, I had him around the same place as you. Like I had him around 40, felt right. But then when I started comparing his career to guys, um, he couldn't stay that. He had to move up a bit. Like, for instance, like guys who are close to him who he's ahead of, I couldn't in good conscience put Jake the Snake ahead of him. Right. Like, I, I just couldn't because as much as he's a memorable character and as much as Triple H has those just dog shit moments that make me want to never watch wrestling again, yeah. he's just got so much good too. Yeah. And, and, and I think part of it is I was watching 2000 <laughs> as I was submitting the list. Yeah, well, that's going to skew. But I mean – but I mean, even like even some of his later stuff, like he he's got good matches everywhere. It's just he's got awful ones everywhere too. And then there's all the political stuff which we hate, right? So, um, I mean, I, to me, his biggest his biggest flaw, and and this is what really keeps him out from being an elite talent for me, is he has a complete inability to read a crowd or to read a situation. And I've never seen that more in a top guy than him. Right. It's just a tone deaf game. <laughs> it is, and, and it makes it worse. And you know, I, I I tried to leave the political stuff out of this. Like I didn't put factor that in really anywhere. 
And what makes it um, frustrating is not only does he not know how to read the crowd, but because of his position, he's actually had the power to like make changes to avoid that. Right. Yeah. So in the in his position, he could have read the crowd in Dallas and said, all right, this show has been, you know, eight, nine hours a, a 25 minute epic with Roman Reigns is not the way to go. Let's let's go five. You know, let's let's make it a sprint yeah. again. <laughs> You know, he, he it's happened time and time again with him, stuff like that. So, and yeah. He, he pulls everyone in to watch to wrestling a Triple H match. Right. We're just it's just not suited to some guys. Like he's he's wrestling Goldberg where like he's got Goldberg on the mat and he's working the leg for 10 minutes. Like right. it, that match does not work with certain guys and every single person he wrestles has to wrestle that match regardless of who they are, regardless of what the storyline is, regardless of anything. It's the same I mean, obviously there's variety in there, but it's it's essentially the same match of Triple H methodically working something over, and then, and and then finally working towards him beating them with a pedigree. And I find his best matches are where he gets pulled out of that comfort zone. Right. Like, well, I mean, then there's that, like I, there's that in between though too, right? So there's like out of the comfort zone, but then he has that weird like. So he has the one you talked about, but also has like the garbagey style that he like had, did a lot in like oh four oh five. Um, right, but it was still like within his template, right? Like, and he kind of brought that back in that Reigns match too. There's like some plunder and brawling, and but it's still within the Triple H methodology. Yeah, and 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 it's weird. Like, I mean, even if you look at his last few WrestleManias, he's the longest match on the show every year, and he's probably the least suited at this point to have a long match. And I'm sure there'd be an argument to say that he tells a story in the match, but it's a fucking boring story, and I'm tired of seeing it. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, like, even the ones I kind of like, uh, I could still see, like, the issues with. Like, I liked the Rollins one. Like, I didn't think that was, you know, I thought that was pretty good, Rollins at WrestleMania 33. But, again, it was in that same, you know, formula, and it went long. <laughs> so, But, but like, yeah. that was, like, that when the formula works well, like, you get that match. Which is, you know, not great, but it's still pretty good. Um, <clears throat> and I think well, you, and you can still go. I mean... You know, you talk about the good stuff he has. Obviously, he's got the Daniel Bryan match. Like, I mean, he he may be up there for number of five star matches or whatever. Let's call it four and a half to five, right? So you got the Bryan match, you got the Three Stages of Hell, got the Cactus matches, got the Rock Iron Man match, the Rock Backlash match. Um, you know that Three Stages of Hell. Yeah, I just rewatched the it. The Austin one. Yeah, and I I do still think it's very good, but again, I think it suffers from being a Triple H match. Right. I think, like, if anyone else having that match, I think you're almost guaranteed a five-star. To me, it doesn't quite get there because of the slow parts. And then you get the one with him and Sean, which is a Awful. mess. Yeah. Um, and the him and Sean feud had diminishing returns, right? So you had the, you had the really good stuff, and then as it wore on further and further, it got worse and worse. Yeah, I mean, look, you got the you got the Iron Man with Rock, which is really you got almost a lot of the stuff with Rock is really strong. Like the ladder match at ninety eight SummerSlam is is still great, still holds up really well. Um, I would I would even put a couple of the Ric Flair matches from 05. Right. I oh love yeah, those are great. Last man yeah. standing from 05. and 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 it's funny because that's a typical Triple H match, but I feel with the emotion they brought out, it actually worked quite mm -hmm. well. Yeah, both of those, Last Man Standing and the Cage. Um... All right, so then you know, he's got all stuff with Orton, which never really clicked. He's got a bunch of those. Uh, he's got the cell with Batista, though, which is great. You know, so like it's it's up and down. And then you have the mileage may vary matches, which is the the Taker Cell Mania matches. You know, the two Mania matches. Yeah. Um, the awful Brock series. You know, like they had the one good one, which I thought was yeah. the the Kate. Is the Cage a good one? I know they have the three. I thought the first one at SummerSlam was the good one where he tapped out. You don't like the Cage? I gotta, I'd have to rewatch the Cage one. Uh, I know the Mania one was was shit, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, he's you know we talked about this. I think we 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 talked about Triple H pretty extensively. Oh, yeah. on you know making the cut. Um. So I don't know if we have to dive into every match of his, but I, yeah, he's just. I can see why you have him where you have him. Some of the yeah. guys you have behind him, I think I have ahead of him. <laughs> um, and we'll we'll get to some of them, but it's yeah. I, I don't know. He's just. He he's like a. He's a rich man's cane at this point, right? So. <laughs> Well, you can make an argument he has more bad stuff than Kane. But he also has more good stuff, right? So that that's what I'm oh, saying. Yeah, way he's, more. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like a you know, he's he's Kane like on 
<laughs> he's Kane on steroids. Um, but but really he is because you know Kane. We talked about having so much bad and so much good that it kind of cancels out. And to me, that's what Triple H is as well. And it's just at a higher level. His good is is way better, and his bad is is just fucking terrible. And it's he, way worse. And he right. dominates so much of TV in that stretch of you know O two to fucking 09 right i mean and we're not even talking about the dx stuff in like 06 um which is crap and then his comeback in 07 which is blah, you know and then you know it gets going a little bit with hardy things. but um but he's yeah. in there with the hottest guy in the promotion with hardy right yeah at that point you know like of course the matches are going to be fine but does it end up working is it end up i remember he beats hardy like clean like midway through 08 you know like and look at his main, you know, and his main, main events too, right? It's like the awesome. Orton one bombs. The Jericho one was probably the best of the three, and you know that's fine. It's not even good. <laughs> I mean, it's good. I think it's good. It's not. It's not a main, main event level good. It's you know like mid range. Um, and then the Reigns one was was rough. So like, his, yeah, his big and you three can give him moments. <laughs> well, you can give him credit for the Benoit Michaels one, but he's also in there with Benoit and Michaels, right? Like, and he was a big part of that match. You're right. I, I mean, he yeah. worked his ass off, and he he tapped out. And you get the Batista one too, which again is more on the Jericho level. Like it's fine, but again, misread so, the crowd. Right? That should have been just Batista murdering him. Yeah, not Triple H working the fucking leg for like 25 minutes. If I had more time and energy, like I've always wanted to chronicle something about him. Since he became a top face, like in O2, I think two really interesting things have happened. Mm -hmm. Number one, the ratings have consistently <laughs> gone down. Right. But number two, I don't feel they've ever been really successful at creating another top face. You don't think Roman Reigns is a top? <laughs> um, <laughs> Except Roman Reigns. Obviously. How about Cena? You don't count Cena? Well, he's, he was never accepted as the fan, for, for half yeah. the fan base. And, and a, I think a lot of that had to do with, with Triple H being there. How about Triple punk? H? You don't count punk? Never, never considered a top face by the company. Okay. Ne Brian either. Like, ne ne never pushed in a position, mm -hmm. like, never pushed more than Triple H was as a top face. Like, before that, you had Hogan, you had Austin, you had Rock, you right, had even right. had Savage, you can throw in there. You know, you had guys that were positioned as top faces. Triple H becomes the top face and uh, in 02. And since then, no one has ever been pushed at that level. Mm. Like and, and accepted by the fan base. Right. And I think it, it it has to do with him being there and him never having his role diminished in any way. Mm -hmm. It was never like, okay, here's Cena, it's and, and here's your guy, it's Cena. Oh, but here's Triple H right. too. Yeah. And Triple H is telling you Cena can't wrestle. Right. Right. And he said Triple H should be in jail because he's black. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. Right. So, like, I don't think they've never and, – and because he's been such a constant presence and no one's ever really gone over him, like, in a real substantial way where they're the right. the, the number one guy. Well, you, So you don't count Batista? No. Because – and here's why. Because – and, and I'm sure we could argue this back and forth, was never as hot as he was beating – before he fought Triple H the first time at Mania. He uh. never reached that same level. Like if you listen to his pop at uh, Royal Rumble 05, yeah. the pops he was getting coming to the ring, and, and maybe the first match. The first match, fine. But he's dragged into he's dragged into that match. Now the next night on Raw, who's the first person you see? Should be Batista, right? Mm. It's Triple H. Triple H coming out and talking. So again, Batista at this point still not presented as the, the top guy. And for me, these are subtle things. They're not right. things that like – you can say Batista's a champion. Batista beat him. So do, like, you, do you think Batista going to SmackDown is what made him elevate, getting away from Triple H? Um, I don't think Batista was ever the same. Really? See, I, I, yeah. that I would disagree with because he was presented and treated like a top guy. I mean – he was protected as such as well. Like he always was given big matches. He was always in the main event picture. He was the king of SmackDown. Long feud with Undertaker. Yes. Feuding with Edge. I, like feuding with Cena. Some, like it, look at all his feuds. You know, there's something in it that you're saying um, that, you, that when he went to SmackDown. But I will say this: Do you think Bad Batista could have been a transcendent star? Maybe not to the level of Austin Rock, but could he have been bigger than he was? Um. Yeah, but this one, I don't. I don't pin a Triple H. I pin it when you look at the um, 
mm-hmm. brand split era. And I almost pin it more on Cena being pushed as a top guy. Like, I think if they gave Batista the Cena push, and as we're seeing now, like, Batista has the, you know, he's yeah. the movie star, right? So, and Cena, I mean, Cena is too, right? He got there too. Um, but I, I think if Batista got the Cena push in in those 2000s as the uh, face of the franchise, but because right. they had the two brands and the Raw and the SmackDown, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I think that almost limited Batista. I also think his age worked against him a little bit. Um at that time, that's possible. Like I think they didn't want to saddle the rocket to a guy who was like 37 or whatever, you know. So, uh, but now I'm looking so back, curious. obviously that <laughs> may have been a mistake. Yeah. But and even now, like I think he'd come back and probably fucking wrestle full time if they would just get behind him. Um, they just believe in him. Right. Um, like I, I think, I think, I think it's a consequence of the crowd reactions not being as big too. Like I, I, I think you're probably onto something to a certain degree with Cena. That's probably a very good point. But I also don't discount the fact that he came out of that feud with Triple H not as hot. All right. Okay. Let's pause the Batista talk because he's actually coming up pretty soon. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, let's get we'll back on shitting. On, and it's yeah. funny that I'm the one shitting on Triple H and I have him higher. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, for you, it sounds like it's just more like guys you couldn't have below him, right? I mean, that's yes. And 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 I and I begrudgingly admit that like he's got a he's got a at, at the very least. A massive catalog of good matches, mm-hmm. and he's got a, a pretty good catalog of great matches and a, a catalog of high tier matches. Yeah, so like I mean, I have Tito above him, right? And, and I, he obviously yeah. never has like the five star, but he also doesn't have just the mounds of shit. And I think Tito's just a better worker, right? So he 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 checks in higher for me at work rate. And fuck it, I think he's not that far off on promos, honestly. When you look within <laughs> oh, the character, his promos are terrible. I mean, so it's there, right? I, I think his connection with the crowd is better. Tito versus Triple H. Um, overall, when you look at their full body of work, and uh, yeah, so I think what he's just lacking is maybe those big matches and moments. But you know what? For what he was given the opportunity, he made stuff big. You know, yeah, he he never had a Tito was never given a shot that he didn't deliver on, right? Triple H has been given millions of shots that he has not delivered has on. Taken millions of shots, right? Yeah, you exactly. But even if you even kidding. if you leave that part out of it, right? Because I think you can, and it still works against him. He was still given multiple big mania sp- main events and other stuff, and uh, again failed to really deliver. And you know, we're not even really talking about his first couple of years where he didn't do much. Um, 95, 96, 97, until he gets hooked up with Sean and even, you know, Goldust kind of pulls him, pulls him up in China. You know, he needed China to get heat. And his first DX stuff is good, memorable. And I, I actually like his rise, like 90, late 99, where he's kind of becoming the guy and he's all over like SmackDown and stuff. It was kind of felt like it was his show early on, even though everyone was on both shows. Like, I, I don't mind that, like his initial ro- ascent. And obviously 2000 is great. But from there, it's just been just this jagged mountain range of good and bad. Um, so you to know, me, 40 has always felt right. Cause he, again, he, he almost cancels out, but then I gave him the bump because he's had really good stuff. One of the things that I don't think we've mentioned about him that is coming to me now as I'm thinking about it is there's, there's a real inauthenticity to him like, yeah. as a character right. on the show. Like he, he never seemed to be the person that they were presenting. Like maybe for a short while while he was the guy who was like obsessed with being champion and obsessed mm-hmm. with being good, which I, is is arguably his best period. Right? Right. But I mean like in DX, I mean he, you knew he wasn't – he's not a rebel or a – he's not one of them. Like the, 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 the legitimacy of that group rested upon X-Pac and like the outlaws really for me. And like even his catchphrases are just like – like the let's get ready to suck it is just a, a weak ripoff of Michael Buffer, which worked. Right. But like – it's there's nothing original or or real about him. He's and a guy. Forward, he was always a guy cosplaying as a main eventer, right? I mean, I, mean, I think everyone pretty much just uh, you know he he wanted to be Rock and Austin, and you know what? Kudos to him because he took that drive and and push, and now he's you know maybe he's actually become this great executive, and who knows, right? So maybe maybe he finally found his niche, and it was a B plus player, ironically enough, but a A plus behind yeah. the scenes, maybe, right? So whatever, but. In the ring, he was never at that level. He was always in that next tier. And yes, on my list, there are probably a bunch of guys that are maybe even below that tier, but don't have the downside that he has. So to me, that's why I had him where I had him. But I think we have uh, probably should move on. <laughs> I think we've exhausted the Triple H talk. Uh, but guess what, Aaron? Uh, <laughs> the hot takes are just, just beginning because up next is our 39th guy uh, overall on my list. I had him at 32. You had him at 42. 
and that is the big dog, uh, Roman Reigns. Um, How did you know he was called the big dog? Isn't that what he's called? Yeah, but like, did you hear it on the show a couple times or something? Or no, I did. You know, I just I look at him and I just, that guy's a that's a <laughs> fucking big dog. That's why it's a know, big wet show. dog. <laughs> Uh, I like Roman Reigns. I do. Uh, victim of not being put, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say political hit, but, you know, not being positioned the way he probably should be positioned a lot of the time. But to me, he's the antithesis, nailed it, <laughs> of Triple nice. H um, in that when he's given those big moments outside of matches with Triple H, he has generally delivered. Yeah. Um Mileage may vary on the most recent stuff with Brock, but in our voting time frame, right, I would say that he usually delivered pretty much – he had a very high hit rate when he was given the opportunity. So, like, his matches with AJ Styles, stuff with Seth Rollins, even the match with Dean Ambrose, the Survivor Series, his matches with Sheamus I thought were pretty good, um, Samoa Joe, like, all that stuff, right? Big Show, like, he had great matches with Big Show on TV and pay-per-view. Yeah. Um, Braun. So, you know, he had like, he can go. Like, I think he's underrated work rate wise um, because everyone just wants to hate him. Promos when he's allowed to be himself is when he's been his best, right? That sit down in Philly during the snowstorm. Really good. Yeah. Um, his one after, after Mania, we beat The Undertaker last year. Really good. And he, you know, that match was all him. Like, he completely carried Undertaker's dead card <laughs> through that match. Um, like, he deserves extra praise for me, in my eyes, for what he did in that match. Um, and again, it's it's not his fault that they keep putting him in these situations and forcing him into a role that he's not extremely best suited for, but he's he works his ass off to make it count. Um, he's got all the Shield stuff, too, which we can't forget. So... Yeah. To me, when you look at the whole package, just because everyone's butthurt that he won the 2015 Rumble and can never get over it, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like like, there's so many missteps in early 15 that have just crippled this company. We've talked about it before, but um, it reigns as part of it. But he also has one of the greatest, if not the greatest WrestleMania main event match of all time, too. So that's a big one, right? Him and Brock at 31 is is an all timer. So, um, but I will say this about that one. I think it's an all timer. But so much of it is based on the catharsis of him getting his ass kicked. Yeah, but that, I mean, sure. There is a real emotional, visceral reaction. But he still but, took the shit kicking and worked his ass oh, yeah, off yeah. in the match. I mean, he, you know, he could have went out there and said, oh, you know, fuck you, Brock. Like, I'm not taking your, your hard wave fucking nonsense. Um, <laughs> but you know what? He went out there and just let Brock beat the shit out of him to earn respect. So, like, to me, that's... That's a baller match right there. Like, that's, you know, no one wanted to see this guy in this match. They all wanted Daniel Bryan in the match. And guess what? Rain said, fuck you. And he went out there and delivered one of the best mania matches of all time and, and took his, took his licks to prove himself. And if they just let him win the title, we're probably looking at it again, a different run. So this speaks to the issues in the beginning of 2015 where they had a bunch of missteps. Yeah. Well, look, I think, um, Rain's on work rate. I don't think we should be questioning it anymore. No. Like he, he has enough to show. I will say that there was a period in, I want to say early 16 where he was on Raw and SmackDown wrestling all the time, and I found him extremely lazy yeah. during in, in those matches. Yep. Um, and, and it's just because the show was so built around him at that point that like being lazy in those matches to me felt a little inexcusable. Mm-hmm. But that being said, he's got so much good stuff. I think it's just all – to me, all the other categories hurt him a little bit. Now I have him at 42, so obviously I think he's great. Um, I, I, don't, I don't hate him. Right. Um, like, uh, but – I will say that he is very generic in every single way. Like, with the exception of his looks, because his looks are, I think, the main reason why he's pushed. But um, his music is generic. His look is generic. Um, his move set is pretty generic. Like, it, it, it feels a lot like a... Again, we talk like an inauthenticity with, mm-hmm. with Triple H, yeah. but I feel it with him too. Like there's no connection when he's cocking his fist. It just looks rid- like nothing really clicks. And I and I don't know if that's because they're telling him to do it that way. Like I wish, because he's so talented in ring, I wish he would challenge himself more and take more risks in the right. matches in terms of like how he structures them, in terms of like I feel like how- they don't want him to. Like I really feel like <laughs> it's just the way he – I mean – 
you talk about like creative wrestler guys. I mean, he's like a creative performance center guy, right? I mean, so they pretty much molded this dude into like what their ideal main event face should be. And because of one misstep, it threw them all off track. Because if you if you rewind to Rumble 14, the crowd is biting on all that stuff, right? They they they're into all that stuff. Like they're connecting yeah. with him on all that stuff. But they're not into but they're not into that stuff because of him at that. But they're into some of his moves, but they're not like I feel one of the narratives of 2014, like you guys were cheering for Roman Reigns the year before. It's true that they were cheering for him, but they were cheering for him because he wasn't Batista. Yeah, no, no, I think he was he was building organically. Another I, misstep I, I, with him too was that um, when he misses the time and he comes back and he he beats Orton. What's that? SummerSlam is that fourteen or fifteen? Fourteen. Right. So he comes back and like that was was a suspension. That was suspension, right? Or is it injury? No, no, that was injury. Right. So that that stunted his momentum a bit because he was you know still pretty hot coming off a of mania after the turn. Um, well, and then what, what the, where the misstep was, and even though this probably takes us out of the Brock title match, you know, so you'd take that off his resume, was not letting him take that Ultimate Warrior year of yeah. being the IC champion, right? So I think Rusev or whoever was like big card Rusev. champ at that point, right? He yeah. should have won that belt and just undefeated for a year as IC champion going into Mania 16. Like, that would have been the move to me. Yeah, like... I mean, you, you rearrange, I mean, I, I will rearrange the WrestleMania card, but I want to go earlier for a second too, yeah. but let's just do the rest. If you, if you just run Brian Lesnar at WrestleMania, okay, and Brian you have, dies, but yes, <laughs> no, he's in that ladder match. He's getting head butted. <laughs> like, um, if you, but, but if you have, uh, Reigns and Rusev's undefeated streak with the tank. Yes. That's that's where he needs to be. Yep. And you want to have your open challenge with Cena? Put him in the damn ladder match and have him win the IC, which he's right. never won. Right. I think that fixes the problem. But or I have him fight Brock, back. and you know. Sure, yeah. sure, yeah, they can do that too. Um, I think it goes back to a year, and I think the miss, the big one of the bigger missteps with him that I don't feel we talk about enough is, is that when the Shield broke up, they were together. They were a main event act. I would, mm-hmm. I would say, when they broke up, they relegated uh, Ambrose and Rollins to the mid card and Reigns to the main event, but for no discernible reason. Right. There was no reason for him to be in that uh, – it was the, as the match for the championship at Money in the Bank 14. Right. Which is where we met for the first time. It was. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yes, except for him in the match. Um, but, um, no, we met so there was no. Oh, no. It was Philly you came to. That's right. No, I feel yeah. Um, there was no reason for him to be in that match uh, and, and to, to, to suddenly be up in the main event. So that Ultimate Warrior you're talking about mm-hmm. would have done nothing but good. He was just suddenly a main eventer. Right. He was suddenly the next top guy. And and it goes back to like very few people have ever had that, like and have it work. I mean, Brock did, but he was a freak of nature, and he was a heel, right? Everyone else had that time, and and I think even though WrestleMania 31 really hurt him, I think that really hurt him too, right? Because he came back from that injury. The interviews he cut when he came back were awful, right? He cuts one at the NXT show, he cuts one at the TLC, and it just sounds like a clown, like cutting promos, right? And I just I mean, he didn't recover from uh, that Royal Rumble, but I think it started earlier than that. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, he should have had the year. His crowning moment yeah. should have been in Dallas. That, that's all. I mean, so whether it's against Brock, Triple A, whoever you want it to be, his sure. climb should have been dominate, win a mid card title, hold it for a year. Even if he goes into Mania as U.S. champ or IC champ, you know, and loses it, you know, unify, however you want to do it, right? So have him win sure. the 16 Rumble and and then go to Mania there instead instead of what they did and i think that but even if you want to keep it what they did the way they did it so he, he gets cashed in on blah 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 um they rehab him in 15 they team with ambrose and that kind of works right the crowd kind of gets behind him again throughout 15 um yeah. i think they had it again w- with you know him winning the tournament like that the crowd's into that moment he gets a pop and then Sheamus fucking cashes in and you yeah. take it away from him again but then on top of that, you you they somehow stumble into it one more time because he beat Sheamus and the crowd's into that. I was at you know in we Philly. were at the show in we Philly. Show? No, I wasn't in it. But well, not in Philly. The the show was in Boston, and then the next night was in Philly, right? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm thinking of the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So he wins. He wins the in TLC against Sheamus, and that's when he um then he spear he beats up Vince at the end of the show, or whatever. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't win that night. He loses that night. Oh, that's right. He wins the next night. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So he loses that night, but then he beats the shit out of Vince, right? 
Is that what it is? Or Stephanie? Who did he beat up after that show? Vince. Yeah, he beats up Vince. And then he wins the title the next night. And the crowd goes yeah. nuts in Philly. Like, okay, back on track. And then what do you do? You have Triple H to win the title from him in the fucking Rumble. And then yeah. you put on that dog shit WrestleMania match. <laughs> and that was yeah. it. And, that was, and to me, that was the, the nail. But then you almost fucking stumble into it again against AJ Styles, right? He has these two great matches. And yeah. by that point is when he should have went heel. was sometime in there. Um, if you stay on that path that they were on. So... Again, I, I think he's worthy where we both have him. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think there's too much against saying he's one of the top thirty-five to forty guys in history. I know some may think that's egregious, but top forty-two. Yeah, top forty-two. Yes. <laughs> um, on the overall list, he finished at forty, so not far off. So I'm actually had him at six, though. Six. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine if you think he's at six. I'm not trying to sound like a dick. Anybody's listening, I'm really not trying to sound like a dick. Yeah, I'm no, just, I'm, I'm playing it up. Six, six feels I'm high. playing it up. Yeah. You're fucking idiots, and I'm playing it up. No, if you look at some of the names, I'm scrolling through all the people who got six place votes. You know, he, he's clearly one of the outliers <laughs> in the six in right. the six range, along with uh, Antonino Rocca. But you um, know, I, I could probably see, I, I, I could probably accept for me someone putting him top twenty. Right. I mean, I wouldn't, but like, I think he's got enough in the tank that like his agree there. Right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see who had him six, but it's giving me a hard time here. Anyway, um, someone had him six. Gotta shame them privately then. Yeah. <laughs> to figure it out and show up at their house. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, oh no, I'm sorry. Eight. That's why I couldn't find him. Someone had him eight, not six. Does that make you feel better? Not really. <laughs> like the person who has him eight, who's, who's right before him and right after him? Uh, Jericho before Foley after. I got him ahead of Mick Foley. Mm, and Hogan. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Hogan treatment, we'll, we'll get right. to Hogan, but yeah. the Hogan treatment on this list is is upsetting and appalling. Right, yep. All right, let's keep going. Uh, we're, now we're making some progress. Okay, so let's yep. get to know our number 38 collectively, and this is another good one. So you have this man at 32. I had him at 44, so almost the inverse of the reins, and that is right. Ravishing Rick Rude. Um and I'm not I'm not afraid to say I may have him lower if I did this list today. Scott and I have been watching his early stuff on Place to Be Podcast. And yes, I know it's his early months, but you know what? I would chuck off completely his late 87 to mid 88 stuff. Like, I haven't seen anything yet that makes me think this guy was going to be anything. So I'm lopping off almost a full year of, off his WF career, which then takes me to 88 to 90. So now we're talking about a two-year stretch for him, um, all as a heel, and his Best matches are with one man, which is? Well, uh, the supreme worker, the ultimate warrior. And I'm I'm putting this hot take out there, and I actually was debating this with a few of our friends at the uh, Rotella Memorial Day party when I was on my Rick Rude soapbox. Um, <laughs> I'm positing that the ultimate warrior carried those matches and not Rick Rude because warrior I... has the better catalog when it comes to Dirty F matches. And Rude doesn't. Now, Rude becomes a superior worker in WCW when he has one of the best years ever in 92. But his WF work, I, I, Warrior has more matches on his resume than Rick Rude does. Um, and better it's, matches. It's good matches in the WF. And what's his best non-Warrior match? The, the Probably the Piper cage? Yeah. I, I The one I have listed is like him part of the Survivor Series at 1989. Right. Okay. So... You know, and how much of that is him and not perfect. Yeah. You know, uh, what are his other big matches? Big? Like Steam, I mean, Steamboat at Rumble 88 is disappointing. Jake at WrestleMania 4 is disappointing. Awful. Yeah. Uh, Junkyard Dog, where the fuck he fights at SummerSlam. Terrible. Uh, Survivor Series, he's just kind he's of so, there. He's always good in the Survivor Series. Right. So good. Because he's good at, at the quick. Yeah, so this is my. So this. Okay. So you, you know, kind of leads to my point. Um, He's good in those matches. You know why? Because he's in for a spurt. You know, like he's yeah. in for spurts and he's good, good burst offense. But him as a heel carrying these matches is fucking no. dreadful. Like it's chin lock, chin lock, chin lock, chin lock. And I mean, there's so many chin locks in there. And it's like a lot, you know, he's just a seated one. So it's not quite the Orton chin lock, but there's so many <laughs> chin locks. And yes, he is an all time character, an all time promo that eh, still had Bobby Heenan doing a lot of his talking, but an all time talker, um, all time character. He's got some jump up moments, but to me, to say he's like a top thirty WF career of all time, 
I couldn't put him ahead of guys like like an Edge, um, you know, guys we haven't talked about yet. So I, I won't mention them. But even like a Tito, like I don't think he sniffs Tito. Like yeah, he has the better, more memorable character, but Tito's got better, way better matches than him, um, and and way better work rate than him. So yeah, I just I I I think that Rude was a very memorable character. I fine for being a Hall of Famer, but when you break down a list like this. I just I felt like he was more like in that forty to fifty range than anything higher. And I like I said now when I cut off another year from his career, I may have him like fifty to sixty. Yeah, I could see I could see you making that argument uh, when you're weighing his ring work heavily, um, which which you should. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, for me, the reason he goes as high as he does is is I do think there are so few characters that are as iconic as Ravishing Rick Rude. Top to bottom, that character is just so strong. Mm -hmm. He's got so many moments, maybe not necessarily in the matches, but he's got so many moments. And on top of it, he does have the all-time matches with Warrior. I say all-time. I say, I think it's SummerSlam 89 match. is probably his best match in the company. Would you agree? Yeah, and then I think SummerSlam 90 is fine. WrestleMania 5. Yeah. Like, the, those are good. You know, those SummerSlam are good. 90 and WrestleMania 5 are yeah. good. But yeah, SummerSlam like, 89 if, is, is Rude's best match. If he didn't have those, I'd probably have him closer to 50. But because he has those, and because his character is so iconic, I mean, he might be one of the better heels they've ever had in terms of, like, drawing heat, in terms of character, sure. in terms of look, you know, like, in terms of how the announcers dealt with him, in terms of entrance, in terms of everything that makes a superstar a superstar. He just didn't have um, the ring work to go higher for me. And it's funny because he, he uh, with my with who I have right in front of him, there was an argument online between him and the other person. And in the end, it was the matches that put the other person ahead. We'll get mm-hmm. to him soon. Um, but yeah, his character is just too iconic for me um, and too, too really great for me to put – Lower, and we're gonna get to some hypocrisy, I'm sure, in our next guy. We talk about with yeah. that for me. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah. All right, because why don't we just continue then? Because I think our next two actually kind of fit this. Um, so our next one yeah. is our number 37 total. I had him at 31. You had him at 47. So a big disparity yeah. here, and that is the million dollar man Ted DiBiase, who I, I think falls into the exact uh, scenario you're talking about. Iconic yeah. heel. All time heel, all time memorable character, and again lacks the real high level matches um, in the WWF, which is funny because he's heralded as one of the greatest workers. You know, when you think of him, I, I feel like he was wasn't always given the spots to succeed though. And what's funny is one of the common denominators who's coming up in a minute between the two disappointing <laughs> disappointing matches. You wonder where that guy comes into play with these two guys, right? Because they had iconic feuds and shit blow offs. Um, but the DiBiase has more longevity, so he checks the box here. He did it as a tag and as a single. Um, you know, he, he has those moments. He had he had some bigger spots. So I had DiBiase, um, you, you know, what, about 10 spots higher than Rude? Yeah. 13 spots higher than Rude. Looking back at this, I, I don't know if I would drop him back a little bit, but he just always felt like I have this cluster of guys coming up right here that always just felt around the same to me. And I just thought Rude was like a step behind them because he just didn't have as many moments and matches as they did. And I think DiBiase is a more iconic character than Rude. Like if you were to name the two guys, I think DiBiase gets more. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember him. No, see, I, I like Rude a lot more as a character. Yeah? I, I, I like DiBiase a lot too. Don't get me wrong. I like him as a character. Um, I think I think he's hurt. I mean, it's stupid, but he doesn't have anything resembling Rude and the Warrior. And I think for me, that was one of the bigger things that hurt him. Because I think his yeah. character should have pushed him up. And I do think he was probably given more opportunity than Rude. Um, like he, well, he was he, around longer than Rude. I mean, you know. And he, he, had, a, and he had a main event run. Right. right? Which, I mean, which, which he did deliver. Like, the Savage series he has is is good. Um the mania, the, match match is tough. the mania match is tough to judge because it, that night is so weird. They've rested. They only get nine minutes in the main event. Like, it's hard to really hold that match against them in yeah. any way. Um, their match the month, the, a few weeks before the Saturday's main event is really good. I just watched one uh, from April of 88 uh, at MSG. That was really good. Um, I like the WrestleFest match. So, like, and, and I think he's great in the SummerSlam 88 match. So, I think he has a lot of that. But he's almost de-pushed, like, right away after that, like, into 89. He's just... 
given not much yeah, to work with. And I mean, then he's he in there like, with the same guys as Rude would have been, like Jake and Snooka and like Beefcake. You know, he gets a fumbling beefcake at five. Like he doesn't that's nothing. He gets like no shot there. But he's also great in the rumbles. Like his rumbles are, are equal to like the Survivor series. Eighty nine is great, but ninety is great too, where he gets number one. Um Oh, that's what I meant. I meant 90s. Oh, yeah. But even 89 is good when he comes in late and he's trying to buy off, you know, whatever. So, but, you know, 90s is iconic one. Yeah. Um, and he's got the, mo- you know, the match of Virgil, which is really, really good too at SummerSlam. I mean, that, you know, to, to me, Warrior is, you know, better worker than Virgil. It's like, oh, DiBiase yeah. getting like a near four star match out of fucking Virgil is just as in- impressive to me as Warrior Rude at four and a half. Um, is Warrior getting a four star match out of fucking Rick Rude? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And then he's got the, uh, you know, Money Inc. I know, I know you hate Money Inc. But yeah, I would see. I I would hold that tag. I hold that tag work against him. Right. Like I, I I hate that run. I think I think that run kills the tag division. Yeah. And I think he's a huge part of that. I don't think he's the sole part of it, but he's right. the a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, I mean, it's not only I, I. You can't only put the blame on him. But like, is there a good Money Inc. match? I've never seen one. Yeah, I don't know who do they have to work with though. Well, he worked with LOD. Oh, I mean, that was that was Shell LOD. I mean, no one. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. I'll say this. LOD, I mean, Shell LOD. I don't know how we compare this, but like LOD have more matches with wins than they're having with Money, Inc. in 92. And that's even, that's five years later. Yeah. Even more of a show. Hawk like, was a real disaster in 92, for, though, right? I mean, he. They leave, right, a disaster they in '97, also. <laughs> yeah, but I think you. Yeah, I don't know that that exact stretch when they. Who, what matches did they have with LOD? Just uh, SummerSlam. SummerSlam, and I thought I saw another one. I don't I'm not remembering the date now though, but I have seen more than one. Hmm. But they also fought the disasters, which are terrible. Hogan and Beefcake is awful at WrestleMania. Yeah, look at the names you're saying. Who, who would name me a good natural disasters match? But but, that, but you but earthquake earthquake is lauded as a good worker, right? Yeah, but name me a good natural disasters match. Where it's like, I don't have one. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm holding. I hold them responsible too. And I think we right. talked about this when we talked about earthquake. Yeah. So give me a good one there. Give me a good, you know, fucking whatever face nasty boys match. <laughs> you know, I don't know, like, like <laughs> who do they have? But, but I, D- I just don't but see. But Dibiase, but Dibiase yeah. is lauded as this great worker. Yeah, so he what should you be doing with at things? least pulling them up to good. Well, I, say, I, don't, I like that SummerSlam '92 match. Like, I know you don't like it, but like, I think it's fine. Boring as shit. Great heat, great heat throughout the match. I, I just, I, I just, that run for me just kills him, kills him dead. And that that Hogan Beefcake match is fucking atrocious at WrestleMania Nine. Yeah, but again, you're talking. I mean, did Beefcake have anything over a star when after his motorcycle accident? I mean, <laughs> no, but Hogan Hogan was always at least good for something in these matches. Usually, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Hogan with a year of rust, given twenty minutes in the middle of a, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I just, I, I, I'm trying. I'm not trying to hand wave it all away, but I just I'm think the money ink run for your boy Ted DiBiase. <laughs> but I just don't think he. I just don't think he had anything to work with. You know, like I'm comparing that to Rude, is, is having matches with like Steamboat on these MSG, like you know, matches with with good workers that he's just like he's just locked in fucking chin locks forever. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think they're at least equitable as characters. And I, I don't know. You could argue. I think DiBiase is a better promo than Rude. Um, you mentioned Triple H's template. I mean, Rude pretty much had the same template. Yeah, I, I would. Agree I think DiBiase went off template more. But I think Rude's. Um, I think Rude's matches are his weakest part. Don't get me wrong. The only thing I would add is that, like, when I watch them back, even the Rude slow matches. Now, some of them are awful, but most. I, I would almost rather watch a Rick Rude match than a DiBiase match during that era. There are exceptions, obviously. Right. But yeah, I think they're both. I think they're interesting cases because I think they're both guys that are overrated based on nostalgia. Like I considered putting JBL ahead of Teddy Biasi. Yeah. And I know that's kind of a crazy thought, but like when I started thinking about their characters, I was like, you know, their characters are both really good. Like they're right. both strong. JBL got really good in the character, and then JBL has a bunch of good matches. Yeah. He like he's got that flop too. Yeah. But he'll he'll always have that match with Cena, right? Right. Like, but he also has all the Bradshaw shit, some of the early acolytes. You know, like he's got all that extra baggage too. Sure, but so much of that is just squashes. So Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's move on because I, I think we have similar conversation for our next guy. It's funny how we're just kind of – these are all the late 80s, early 90s 
run right here that we have, like four in a row. That it's funny because when I was making my list, these four were always kind of tied near each other. Um, yeah. And that is the guy who was number thirty-one on yours and forty-one on mine, and that is Mister Perfect, um, who I had a notch below Triple H, and it felt right to me because. I, I, you know, he never has the matches that Triple H had, and but he, you know, felt similar in, in ways. And I think another guy that who I love again is a little overrated historically. And I think the common thread with Rude, DiBiase, and Perfect is their best in ring action was always elsewhere. So when you look at these guys holistically, which we were not doing in this project, they're they're well regarded as wrestlers, right? Because they have all that other stuff. They have their DiBiase has his UWF mid south shit to go with his WF character. Rude has his right. 92 WCW to go with his WF character. Mr. Perfect has his AWA stuff, right, to go with his character. So, but when you look at just their WF career, there's suddenly glaring holes. Now, Perfect, you know, looking back at this, I'd probably have him higher than DiBiase, honestly, because... He's got the Brett matches that DBSC doesn't sniff, right? He's got the King of the Ring 93 and the SummerSlam 91 and the Flair Raw match. So I think all those are probably better than DBSC's best matches. And um, I would also posit that I don't think he has – I don't think he has the bad matches that DBSC and Rude right. have. So looking at this, I'd probably – I would leave Rude where he is. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I may flip DBSC and Perfect looking back at this. Um, I guess my issue with Perfect is the bulk of his run – 88 to, you know, SummerSlam 91 when he gets hurt, like, where are the big matches there? Like, you know, he gets this, the shot with Hogan and Warrior. Um, he's supposed to be this real big work rate guy. But, like, and I know it's kind of a work rate devoid year, like 90. He's got the match with Tito. But I, I feel like that Tito matches his cap until he, get, he meets up with Brett. So then I start to think, okay, well, his best two matches with Brett – you know, he, he works hard in them, but they're with Brett. So his top three matches are with Ric Flair and Bret Hart. And after that, like, who else is he carrying? Like, Boss Man to three stars? So, like, like what – like, where's his other work, I guess, outside of Brett? I haven't seen anything great besides Brett and Flair. And even the Sean match is disappointing. He's got the good one in 91, but again, it's Sean. So, like, when I'm breaking this stuff down, I'm looking for where he's carrying these other guys. And you mentioned that with DiBiase. I felt it with Perfect. <sighs> Yeah, I, I just feel that Perfect was not not really put in the same position DiBiase and Rude were. Because like if you look at his you look at his template of matches, like like I said, I don't think he has the bad matches that Rude and um and DiBiase have. But I mean if you look at his like just his pay per view stuff, mm -hmm. like he's very rarely in there for any length of time and able to produce that kind of right. match. Right. Like I mean, I mean in WrestleMania five he's blue blazer and that's great for what it is. Mm -hmm. Like it's short and it's good. Um then he's got the – he's good at both Survivor Series, 88 and 89. 90, he fights Beefcake at WrestleMania. That match is – it's fine. Like I, I think it's – is it Beefcake's best WrestleMania match? Yeah, probably. Not that that's saying that much. No, but there, Beefcake but like, was, was improving by the point, right? He was just kind of hitting his stride when he got hurt. Yeah. He fights the Red Rooster at SummerSlam. Like that's that's fine. It's Again, it's short though. Like he's not put in the position to, to have those long matches. Right. And, and again, like I've held that against guys too, but like – I think that's what puts him above these two other guys that when mm -hmm. he was put there with time, like I can't think of a Mr. Perfect match where I find it insufferable to watch. No, no. And I can, I can, and, and I, I mean, I think Rick Rude, Jake Roberts uh, is one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time. <laughs> like, yeah, I think we talked about this a while ago and we're ranking them. <laughs> right. Well, and I'm going to, we're going to be talking about that next, uh, next week. I'm pleased <laughs> to be. So I have, I have fresh thoughts. I just watched it. Um, and it's funny because when, when Jeff and I talked about it on Jeff Warren's Wrestling, he didn't even realize it was a tournament match. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, yeah, um, right. Yeah, he doesn't have those the direct matches that those other guys have. Like I said, I mean, I'd, I'd be comfortable probably bumping him up over DiBiase the more we talk about it. Um, but I think that was my thought process when I was putting the list together. Like, before he runs it to Brett, like, what are his best stuff? But like you said, I mean, he didn't always have the shot to show it, so. Yeah, I mean, like, he he was good in everything he did for me. Like, I, my question to you is, if you're going to bump him ahead of DiBiase, right, does that mean you're moving DiBiase back? Or are you moving I'm Mr. Perfect I'm flipping Perfect, Perfect and DiBiase. See, because you're missing, moving Mr. Perfect up, like, ten spots. Yeah. So you're pu you're putting him ahead of, like, all, all these other guys that, like, like you, you were saying before, like, he doesn't have the... 
the pedigree or whatever of like a Triple H. <laughs> but like you'd put him ahead of him, you wouldn't move DiBiase back. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to think. I'm not putting that much thought right now. <laughs> I want to finish this list. Um, and we're not reacting. <laughs> Maybe in five years. I'm, I'm, there's some amalgamation of a DiBiase perfect switch on this list in this ten group of ten from 41 to 31. Good. There's some movement with the two of those guys. Whether it's swapping <laughs> them. Or moving DiBiase back and Perfect up, whatever it is, there's, there's some movement. Triple H has to stay at forty though, so Perfect has to go ahead of him. So, so you would are so your list then between the three of them would be Perfect first, DiBiase second, Rude third. Perfect first, DiBiase second. Yes, yep. And mine would just you'd swap Rude and DiBiase. Yeah, but now that we got a couple other guys coming up, that I, I think kind of get into this conversation. So let's, let's move up to our number thirty-five. Uh, a guy I had at 30, you have at 37. So, again, a similar gap, and that's Jake the Snake Roberts. Um, and uh, to me, he, he falls perfectly in this group. So I think this speaks to the characters of our era growing up, right, the late 80s, early 90s, yeah. how strong the character work was, because all these guys in ring are all about the same at this point. Um, Jake, again, another guy kind of speaks to his ring work, but he was always more of the psychology-based, um, very memorable wrestler, memorable name. Where are his big matches? What put him up for me is his heel work. Um, it's so next level in 91. Like, all the stuff with Savage. Like, that feud is incredible. His Saturday Night's Man event with Savage is great. Um, the early one in 86. Like, I like that a lot. Uh, super over. Never needed a title to be over. The crowd connection was crazy. His promo. See, I think he may be the best of the four uh, promo-wise. So, I'd give him that. Um, worked. He's got the fungibility the other guys don't have as far as working face and heel. Um, well, I guess perfect has face and heel, but Jake was better at both. I, or Jake was better at face and equally as good as heel. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, perfect With who? was perfect. Yeah, I, 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 perfect was fine as a face, but he was pretty much just himself as a heel, right? <laughs> just getting cheated. Yeah, he never like acted like as a face. Um, I don't think perfect was a good face at all. <laughs> no, right. So Jake to me is is a really good face and a, and a tremendous heel. Um, yeah. Also, his finisher. So these guys all have pretty iconic finishes, right? The Rude Awakening, Million Dollar Dream, Perfect Plex. But the DDT, to me, was the best of the four. Like, instant pop, instant moment. Mm-hmm. All he had to do was tease it, and boom. He's got Damien, which is another great hook, which led to a lot of good moments. You know, Earthquake smashing him, him giving Andre the heart attack. Uh, like, all that stuff. So, to me, he he has just, like, a tick more than those guys. The, the, where he's lacking is he doesn't have the, the match as Perfect has. Um, again, but I think Jake checks all the intangible boxes higher than the other guys. Um, that's my thoughts there. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, I have him in 37. So obviously yeah. like he's, he's very close to the top third of all time for me. Right. Um, I, I'll say something about his promos that I'm not, I, I think he's a great promo. I, I think you, you probably have an argument there that he's the greatest. I wonder if he was sometimes a little too cerebral for the audience he was performing for. Sure. Which, which not, I mean, I don't think it hurts him because I, I think you and I can look back and say, wow, that's a fantastic promo. But I wonder if it hurt him in terms of like generating the same heat out of a promo as say Rick Rude talking about banging your wife, right? <laughs> like, right. Like he, he, he had a way with know, words. And you think intensity. so? You know, like that, that promo where he talks about muck of avarice, right? right. Like I think it's, I think that's a fantastic, wonderful promo. I think it's maybe one of the best of all time. But I would not have understood that promo until I was twenty. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you know. Yeah, like, but I think I think his delivery is what matters. So, like, even if you're not oh, it's fully delivery. right, so even if you're not fully grasping what he's saying per se, he you know he's serious now and he means business and he's going to go fuck up DiBiase, right? Just by his his sinister delivery. As a kid, I would tune out a bit of his promos. Yeah, but that's me as a kid, right? Uh, the only the, the big the, part of me. <laughs> I said stupid snot nosed brat. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. Um, uh, I, I would say he probably has the worst matches of anybody we've just talked about. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got some of the duds in there. Um, Andre the Giant at five is awful. I mean, really, that's though, what we talked again, about. Again, I mean, I do put some context to these matches. Like, sure. Andre 89 is, I mean, he is a shell. I mean, just a broken down mess. I mean, so... Jake bringing any level of psychology and interest to that match is, which he does. Like I, I thought, he works well in it. I, I don't know. I, I I find it hard to hold. Now there are ones to hold against him. Like Bad News Brown is fucking terrible. 
Um, the DiBiase one at six is awful. Right, inexcusable uh, for yep. both of them to have that match. That's in that DiBiase moment. too. Yeah. Right. Um, what else have you got? Uh, rooted for again. Rooted these guys for. are all tied together. They're all yeah. they're all interchangeable to me. That's why perfect goes up a bit. Um, right. Some of his comeback matches were pretty awful too. Like I really don't like the the uh, Lawler match ninety six. I mean, it's Lawler doing a drunk thing right but like yeah it's still yeah. not great um like and, and he's one of those guys that i feel every time he was on pay-per-view there was just something off every single time like he couldn't bring it to the big stage match wise right. who does he fight at oh you know what i think my favorite one of my favorite pay-per-view matches of his is when he fights hercules mm-hmm. at uh summer yeah, that's a good one yeah it's a fun little match yeah and i, I think his best pay-per-view match is probably the goddamn blindfold match Right, yeah. I mean, that shouldn't be discounted either. That's a real good, memorable feud, too. Um, yeah. That he really sunk his teeth into. I mean, he does the contact lens. He does the, you know, the, all this stuff on the Brother Love show. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Brother Love slapping. Yeah. He DDTs him. Uh, Survivor Series is great when all his guys get eliminated. He's left alone. He stands tall. You know, he doesn't doesn't give in. Um, the Rumble where he makes the beeline for Martell. I mean, he really took a late career Martell and gave him, like, an epic feud. Yeah. Um, so I really liked all that. A lot. Uh, and then um, the Savage feud to me is just uh, – that, that, I don't know. Like Perfect so, has the matches, but he doesn't have that feud, right? Nobody no. has that feud of these guys. No one has that no. Savage feud with the intensity and the vileness. Like it, it may be the most realistic feud they've ever done, right, is that Jake one where like this sick fucking man – who just basically tried to murder the Ultimate Warrior in, in this cave. <laughs> um, Coffin. Cave of snakes, right? So he, he he pretty much just tried to poison and murder the Ultimate Warrior. Now it turns his attention to destroy a wedding Maris. reception <laughs> and six a snake on this guy to bite him in the middle of the ring, slaps his wife, right? I, I mean, just like this sick fuck, unremorseful. Um, that run from... From the summer of 91 till he leaves is one of the best heel runs of all time. Right down to his tights, yeah. his look. Um, even the match with Undertaker is what it is, but he's so good in that. Just the sick I like that match. Yeah, I have him, no problem with it. Him attacking Taker at the funeral parlor. Just like all that stuff. Um, it, it's just, it's too, just an epic run. Too evil for the Undertaker. Like right. That's what turned the Undertaker face. Right. Like, this guy evil. is even too dark for me. <laughs> For the walking embodiment of death. So, like, like none of those guys have that feud. Like, they just don't. No. They may have matches, but they don't have that feud. And, and you know, we talk about connection and, and story all the time. Like, he just has that one iconic run, to me, that puts him above those other guys. And then, even when you factor in his Savage match, the Savage Man had two heels going out there on national TV at a big spot. Um, Like, like he delivered there. So, I just yeah. wish that Savage feud... I mean, that Savage Feud is a perfect storm in terms of guys with intensity. <laughs> like, um, but, like, I wish they would have had a definitive, like, like a bloody cage match or something right. to end that feud. Like, that would have been the perfect send-off for it. Yeah, it's and I too think- bad they couldn't stretch it to Mania, you know, but they had the other stuff planned and, and whatnot. Like, them and a big blow-off in Mania. It's just the way the pay-per-view schedule went. They never had the shot at it, right? Yeah. You have um, Survivor Series and Jake's Hurt anyway. Um or Sid got hurt, so they take Jake out of it. And then te- Tuesday in Texas, the way the, the paper, the way the paper was built, he was never gonna. They weren't gonna give him twenty minutes. No. Then you get the Rumble, and then suddenly it's Mania, and Savage has other stuff to do. So they never really had the opportunity. You know, Savage pretty much squashes them in February, starting his main event. But their big match is Tuesday in Texas. Like the match, yeah. Savage kills him, gets his revenge, and then you just get the pay those play after, which is just like amazing. Um, yeah. So to me, that's the blow off. It's Tuesday in Texas, which is like that's their big blood match. Yeah, I might move Roberts up based on that feud. Like, it's so it's good. just it's so good. Like, yeah, and I have Sid really high on my list based on like that little run in ninety one, ninety two. So like, and he's I mean he's got a lot of other stuff too, right? I mean he just does, but that so he pads out like he's got more than Sid has on his resume. But when you factor in his promos, his character importance the ddt to me is like super important part of him um because it's synonymous with him like even his comeback run that's like the one thing right he's still got <laughs> that fucking ddt yeah. and, and that cr- vest he's got that vest and the vest but the crowd i mean the crowd just always pop for the ddt even in that rude match of mania the best parts of that match is him teasing the ddt um yes so 
it just always came out of it was, it was the RKO out of nowhere of its era. So yeah, I mean, I felt comfortable having him the highest in this group. I don't have, I have him after rude and perfect. Yeah. So you got to fix that. No, I might, I might not out of okay. spite. All right, well, here's a real interesting one, so you can talk to me uh, here. I'm just going to let you pretty much run the ship on this one, and then we're going to get back to 80s, 90s guy after this. But yeah. our cumulative number 34, solely on the back of you, who had him at 30, and me at 76, and that is Samuel Zane. Um, I assume it's Samuel. It's probably just Sammy. It is Samuel. <laughs> okay. All right, so talk to me about Zane. Why are you in Zane for Zane? In Zane and the Mem Zane. Well... I think the 2014 to 2016 run of Sami Zayn in NXT is one of the best runs anyone's ever had in the company. It's not the big stage, though. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It doesn't, it didn't happen. It doesn't count. Um, I think that run is so perfect on so many levels. I, I, you know, Ricky Steamboat is often is often spoken of as the greatest baby face of all time. Yeah. Now I'm not prepared to say Sami Zayn is the greatest baby face of all time. That's not what I'm saying, but I think the character that he creates in the environment of, of a, of a post attitude era wrestling fan, there have been, maybe you can relate to it a little bit, but it's just such a pure baby face mm-hmm. that it, it's almost impossible to create, and he did it. He, can, he held it over for two years. He had consistently excellent matches every single time he was out there. He has, from my, my vantage, from my point of view, two five-star matches in that stretch, um, which, I mean, if you list the guys that have two five-star matches in the company, there's, there's actually not that many of them. So I think that run is, is as close to perfect as you can get. What His are your two five-stars, Nakamura and Owens? Neville. Neville, okay. Neville, from and and I mean Owens is great too, um, but um, so I would I, I would put that in the in the in the vault for him. I would his, his consistent week to week excellence on NXT is is incredible. His promos he cut as a babyface were tremendous. Um, they were from the heart. They were real. Um, he just worked, and he. I don't think he gets enough credit for helping NXT become what it was. Mm -hmm. He was the heart of NXT for those two years. And then he goes to the main roster. Also, did you mention the Cesaro stuff? Because that was really good too. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's incredible. Uh, it's just, some of it happened before they went to the network. Right. That's right. Sure. Yeah. They They had the one on the premiere, right? Yeah. Which I think I have at four and a half, you know, like, so already let's, that's very good. He has that one off with Cena on Raw where he hurts his shoulder, which is a great match. Um, and then he comes up in 2016, and I think he has an incredibly underrated year on the main roster in 2016. He's just got a ton of great little matches. He's got the, uh, the Intercontinental Four Way with Miz, Cesaro, and Owens from Extreme Rules, which is tremendous. He's got the Kevin Owens match where he Haluva kicks him like two, three times. He's got the ladder match at WrestleMania 16. He's got the match the night after WrestleMania uh, 32 for the number one contender. He's got all the rest of the Kevin Owens matches. He's got the Money in the Bank stuff. He he even the Braun Strowman 10 minute challenge later in the year. Yeah, he's just got a, a, a list, a litany of high. I wouldn't say the Strowman stuff is super high end, but it, but it, but it's it's at least very good. He's just got a litany of excellent matches uh, in that period. 2017, I think he faltered quite a bit. Um, I, I think they have no confidence in him, and I think it's—I think he's done, like as a as a player. But I think that. that well, I'm will... curious too. Like, if we were to do this list this year, how much he'd be affected? Because I know, like, a lot of the stuff in late 17 and most of 18 has been very yeah. shaky and, said, and not well regarded. Like he was good in that triple threat at this year's Rumble. I thought he was very good there. Mm-hmm. But then, like, he's he's just relegated to Kevin Owens' second now, right? Which is, I mean. Which is weird, considering who they are and what they are. But I just think that uh, that run up until 2016, and and even the stuff he's doing now, I don't think it's bad. Like I don't think he's he's bad in any way. I think his matches are still good. He's still fine. He's just not interesting anymore. And I just think that that initial run up until I would say the end of 2016 is so stellar that for me, 
he he somersaults a lot of these guys we were just talking about. Yeah. Like no, I, there's very few people that have his catalog of matches. Yeah, I mean, They're, I'm fine. I'm fine saying 76 is is quite low. I, I I'm not as well versed in some of the t- uh, NXT stuff. Like I'm I'm first to admit it. So like I don't I don't know the regard I have for the Nakamura match because I think I probably watched it like on my iPad doing stuff. You know what I mean? Like I don't think I sat down and really studied the match. So and like I didn't me, I wasn't watching a lot of the week to week NXT. So like not having that background. Probably affected part of my grading. I, I I thought seventy six was like respectful, you know, for me to put him there. Um, because I was well, thinking, that's where he, he finished like a hundred, right, or something like. Uh, yeah, finish. actually, let me look at those other guys. We haven't mentioned the overall finish. Uh, Zayn finished at ninety six. He had a high vote of fourteen. Um, who else did we mention that we didn't talk about their overall? Perfect, uh, rude. So Robert. rude was at forty two. So pretty much around where I had him. Uh. Jake was 27, DiBiase 26, perfect 25. So even even amongst uh, everyone, they were all uh, grouped yeah. together, those three guys. Um, perfect had a high vote of five, Jake six, and DiBiase seven. Jake six is fucking high. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, so I, I think Sami Zayn gets the, um, he gets the knock of like, he didn't do anything on the main roster. But I think if you look at his work, he, he really did. Mm. He did do quite a bit in that first year. How much do you think it hurts that he's doing this in an era, and it's not his fault, it shouldn't be held against him, where, like, these matches are churned out constantly? Like, everyone has, like, to me, the baseline of TV wrestling for WWE has changed. Um, yes. Like, everyone's pretty much having, like, like three is out, like, the bar, right? Like, before it used to be, holy shit, if you got a match on Raw that was, like, a two-and-a-half star match or three, like, it's like, oh, fuck. Um, yeah. Now it's like, if you don't have a three, three-and-a-half star match on Raw and you get the time, it's like, what's wrong with you? You suck. Um, so, like, I think that may hurt him just a little bit. Uh, Taylor Kehi, our buddy, had Jake Roberts six, so what's up, Taylor? Um, l- like, if you are, like, to me, like, that, that, has, that hurts a, a, a little bit. Just a little sure. bit, probably, because I, everyone's having matches that good on, on TV. I would counter, though, with – I mean, I, I agree it hurts. But I would counter, though, that, like, if you look at the emotion that he draws out during his matches, there aren't too many guys that actually do that anymore. Right. Like, Seth Rollins is producing great matches this year, but if any of them really, like, they, they elicit an emotional reaction from the crowd the way this guy winning the title from Neville at TakeOver did – like even his match with Owens, where he finally beats him on the main roster, like, like you you see people just there's a joy to the to watching yeah. him win, you know, and 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 that's something that like we haven't seen in years, like may, maybe with Brian, Brian was maybe the last right. one, and really Rollins now I think I think we're getting there with Rollins now. Yeah, I just don't think he's there yet. No, he's but, getting there. I said he's getting there. Did I say yeah. he's there? Well, you said Rollins now. Yeah, then, then you said, said he's, he's getting, getting there. there. That's a confusing message. No, the message is Rollins right now is is getting there. Nah, there was a period. I heard the period. It was a hard stop. Semicolon. Semicolon. So anyway, I I understand too. I'm probably way high on Sami Zayn, but I I do think that 96 is quite low considering what I think he's accomplished. Yeah. Okay. Send us your hate mail. <clears throat> do it. All right, let's move on. Uh, number 33 cumulatively. Uh, is a guy I had at 29. You had him at 41, so we're still in this range. And a guy, again, yeah. that's known for his 80s, 90s. And someone that I know checked in quite high on the overall list at 30. Um, high vote of three, and that is Greg Dammer Valentine. Someone had Greg Valentine at three. Um, three? Which, again, I guess if you're doing that. Who's me. right behind him? If you're doing that, uh, I'm trying to find who it was. If you're yeah. doing that, you're you're, again, ignoring the the criteria, right? I mean, you're pretty much just going by yeah. work rate. Uh, our buddy Pete had him at three. Uh, he has Bruno right after him. Is him ahead of Bruno? He has Hogan and Austin, eight, nine. Rock, ten. He has Savage, Brett, and, Savage and Brett ahead of him. That's it. Wow. So, Interesting. Uh, I, I love the hammer. It's a guy I've, I've gained a lot of respect for more and more as Scott and I have watched these MSGs and really dove deep into 85, 86, 87. Uh, I think he gets a lot of credit for the work he did with Beefcake because he, he took a guy that was, you know, not much. Yeah. And you can say Valentine carries that team, which he does to an extent, but Beefcake, Beefcake does a lot. Like, he really works his ass off. Um, 
on that team as well. And you could tell he was absorbing a lot of it from Hammer and improving. Like he gets a lot of run in those matches. But but Hammer's the heart of the team. I mean he's he's in there for the majority of the match. Uh you know, the WrestleMania two match is great. And the Tito feud is great. Um again, he, he to me is the heel version of Tito. Great worker. Um, always had good heat and a, a, a kind of an underrated promo because he always ended up having like Jimmy talking for him. But some of those TNTs we were watching, we were doing the network adventure. Like I gained an appreciation from him as a character. I think because he always looked old, you always just assumed he was old. And, <laughs> you know, but like he's kind of cool in that first one. He's got the rock and roll t-shirts and he's got his wife fucking massaging him. You know, like he, he kind of came off like a, like a rock star in a way. Um so again, maybe a guy is a touch high. Like I may have overrated the work part of it, but I, I think he's pretty flawless as an in-ring worker. Um, so I give him like the highest possible marks when it comes to work rate. Um, and, and even his character is understated. It's just a just a fucking bruiser, you know, asshole like like a heel. So um, yeah, I, I mean, probably again re- rethinking this i probably have jake at least ahead of him i had them back to back i probably have perfect maybe ahead of him so maybe he slips into like the mid to low 30s but i wouldn't have much lower than that um and we're not and we're not even really talking about it just because they're not as well versed like i know he's got the really good backland stuff too right um yeah so yeah I, i'm comfortable with him there i see a guy like pete has him three that makes me feel pretty good about having him at 29 i'll put it that way <laughs> look I, like like it justifies think- it like a guy like pete who's seen millions of hours of wrestling he yeah. devours it and digests it and analyzes it at a level that I don't. And he thinks that highly of him, whether he's following the, the criteria or not, makes me feel like, okay, I'm on the right track. Yeah, I think I think in order to really appreciate him, you really have to have an affinity for those early late seventies, early eighties period. Right. Because it's a completely different style and it's a hard style to compare to the style of today. Because like what what made a match great then is not the same things that make a great match now. So like for me, like I, I went back and I studied a lot of the old '70s stuff and a lot of the early '80s when I was making my list originally. And Valentine was a guy I liked a lot. Like I I, I liked a lot of the backland stuff. I, I watched I think three or four, at least three matches of theirs, and I I really enjoyed them. But for me, they never they weren't able to get past a a certain plateau as to what I really enjoy in a match. Right. And that's probably just my modern bias kicking in, but like I can appreciate how good he was and he was really good for a long time mm-hmm. too. Like I, I really, I liked him as the mid card kind of gatekeeper from about like late 87 to like 89. Right. But like guys kind of had to go through him to go up. Like I remember him and beefcake having a series on Saturday night's main event that I liked a lot as a kid. I liked his feud with Garvin. I thought that was fun. Right. Too. I mean, yeah, he, he him and Garvin have a you know fucking banger at <laughs> Rumble ninety. Um, yeah. that, that's pretty much his last gas. But he's got a really good Tito house show match in eighty eight too. I've mentioned before in L A. I think it's December of eighty eight. I reviewed it. You reviewed it on the old message board a while ago. Um, mm-hmm. That was excellent. I mean, I had that like at four, I think, too. And that's you know them in eighty eight just going out and throwing bombs. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the Garvin one's a good one. I forgot to mention that. That that's his last gasp. But even like at five, like him and Honky against the Heart Foundation is like pretty it's solid. Fine. Yeah, his match with Savage at four is probably you know the best match in the show? is the best. I think Savage Gibiasi is better, but it, it's it's a top two match probably at the show or top three. Um, yeah. and, you know, Valentine works hard in that match. So yeah, he, he just never lost that edge as a worker. He was always a rock solid. See, like, I have him at 41, and, and as I'm looking at it, like, I think I probably got a little bit shamed into putting him that high. Like, the more I think about it, just hearing other people talk about it, like, I would probably have him behind a guy like Davey Boy Smith, mm-hmm. behind, like, maybe Cesaro. Like, I, just based on what I like as a worker, like, and what I like in a promo, factoring it all in, I don't know if he, if he, I don't think he'd go much lower, but, like, I think where I have him fits my style of wrestling if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, again, I, I think like Tito, if I had done this list maybe like four years ago or even four years from now when I'm not as immersed in the period. Like, I mean, I was just immersed yeah. in 85, 86, 87 when I made this list. And it bears out. Like, we talked about it when we talked about Harley and other guys. Like, it's just, it's just where I was as a fan when I made this list. I was just watching nonstop this era. And when you're watching shows just filled and stuffed with like, one star matches and quarter star matches and and then you get guys like this rolling out and and pumping out 
three and a half, four. Sure, it may not sound like a lot, but, but again, it's something. And and you know, I, I compare it to like Sami Zayn, like you said, like, yeah, he he has all these great matches, but a guy like Valentine's not getting that weekly shot, right, to have those matches for us to right. have. And maybe he was around the country, and we just don't get to see them. But you know, on on TV, he's fighting fucking Brian Walsh and these other other jamokes. You know what I mean? Like, hey, this, don't shit on Brian Walsh. <laughs> Fighting bums, right? So, like, he's not getting matches with twenty minute matches with Kevin Owens and you know Seth Rollins and whoever else every week. Um, yeah. So, to me, you always have to put it on that scale too. Like, if if Greg Valentine existed in today's world and he's having the, like he's probably like a Cesaro in a way, right? I mean, um, he's probably out there just as a stalwart, as a stalwart worker. Maybe he doesn't have the personality. He's just putting on great matches. So, I, I think that's part of it. Is he didn't he was in an era when they didn't have those chances. And we've mentioned guys getting chances like a DiBiase, like Hammer didn't have any of those really. After the Tito feud, he had a, you know, he had to work with what he had and he, he's given rugged Ronnie Garvin 1990 for, for a big right. feud. And he, he delivers a great match. So I think it speaks to him as a worker. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't dispute that. I, I, I won't, I will never say he's not a good worker. Like I think for me, it just came down to personal preference, but I still have him in the top half. Right. Okay. All right, let's get on to our number 32. Uh, a man you had at 29, I had at 51, so a pretty big gap. And overall, he finished, uh, I want to say he finished in the middle here on the 50. Yeah, 53, with a high vote of 15. That is Seamus. Um, I know you're a big Seamus guy, and I don't think 29 is too crazy. I, I think he's one of those guys that, like, if someone didn't put the thought into it and saw this list, they'd be like, fuck you <laughs> you know like yeah god you have Seamus that high like what are you thinking because he is kind of i think a poster boy of this era um of 50 50 booking triple h's buddy you know maybe has that one stretch where he's probably a little boring um and if you don't really take the time to break down his actual resume you would think this is crazy but when you actually look deep into it I think it's a pretty well deserved spot between this thirty to fifty range. Um but go ahead, tell me why he's at twenty nine for you. I think he's probably one of the most consistent main event guys they've had in the last decade. Like he he's he's just always on. His ring style is I find his ring style so interesting. The offensive moves he does, combination of power and speed that like you don't have too much. He's like half Razor Ramon, half like – I don't want to say half Shawn Michaels, but like he, he's got that quickness to him too. Mm-hmm. Always modifying the move set a little bit. His moves look devastating. He's stiff as hell to watch. And like I find whenever he goes out there, you're in for a – you're in for at the very least a good match and very often a very good, sometimes a great match. Mm-hmm. And I think his catalog is, is, again, much stronger than people give him credit for. Like, I think when he came in, he was kind of saddled with getting that title too soon and then being put into the feud with Triple H, which kind of helps no one. But the match with Triple H at that WrestleMania wasn't horrible. It was, it was fine. Um, but I think he really starts to shine in 2011 when he starts to fight Mark Henry. Yeah. I think he's got that – the, the way he turned face by just saying, I'll fight him, like, is such a, a wonderful thing you don't see anymore. I love that feud. I love that series. I love his ascent. Um, I mean, the Daniel Bryan win is what it is, and we've talked about that at length. But then the ensuing feud with Bryan is so good. Yeah. That that uh, two out of three falls matches. Excellent. I, I'd say it's, it's an all-timer. And then that title run is actually quite under underrated. Like, mm-hmm. I think he was a bit annoying as a character during that period, but his matches with Del Rio, who I also am very high on, are, are all very good, I find. I really dig his mat, his series with the Big Show, and I like the story that he tells with the Big Show, where he like the Big Show keeps warning him, like you got, you can't take me lightly. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you, and then does beat him. Right. Um, and then he kind of goes to reinvent himself back in the mid card. Um, I love, I love his series with Cesaro in 2014, where they're fighting over the U.S. title. Mm-hmm. Um, I, lo- I love his series with Cesaro when they fight to uh, to form the Bar. And I think his work in the bar is exceptional. Yeah, that's been his best stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, he's so, so, so good. I, I, I would argue, I think I think he had a U.S. title run, too, that I thought was very 
Mm-hmm. Very strong. I forget when that was, though. I think it might have been in 2011. I thought he was very good there, too, fighting like Kingston and Ziggler, like around that period. I mean, but, he's a guy, too, that is proof of sometimes it just takes a while to click, right? And and it's one yeah. of the downfalls of the current wrestling world that we're in. Like, oh, this guy's getting buried. Oh, this guy sucks. Like, we saw Braun Strowman. You know, so many other guys. Miz. Like, sometimes it just takes years of reps to, to figure it out. And for Sheamus, it eventually clicked. I think that initial push for him probably hurt right because he wins the title fairly early on and it doesn't really go anywhere and then he gets better later um so he kind of did with a with with like a guy like a jbl and others almost couldn't do um where they recover later like or even reigns right where they get pushed too hard too fast and then reset and recover which he's done really well yeah well they also they they also knew when to pull the plug on him we we also didn't mention he had the king of the ring right which i mean was kind of shitty but he did have a really good feud with morrison which i thought was a lot of fun uh end of 2010 which i really dug too um he's just he's also a really solid base in the multi-man matches like he's great whenever he's in a money in the bank he he's he's so good at the 2011 money in the bank that brian wins he really just pulls that whole match together. And I think that's probably the beginning of his face turn. I also think he doesn't get enough credit like for something as silly as the Andre the Giant Battle Royal at 30 that Cesaro won. He's just holding that thing together the whole way through. He's got great matches with Christian. Like he, He's just consistently excellent in the ring. I think as a promo, he's okay. I don't think he's anything special. I think he gets lumped into like – and, and I, I find he – He's one of the bigger indictments on the writing staff with, with the whole you look stupid thing. Right, yeah. Like that's that's just such lazy bullshit for what he is. But he helped – like he's, he's good. He's always there. And he's a guy that every time he comes out, I'm, I'm, I'm excited every single time. It does bother me that he probably doesn't know his father. But aside from that, I got nothing bad to say about him. Yeah, I'm, I mean I think we're good leaving it there. I mean you're going to make any point I would have made – Maybe a little bit higher. I think, you know, if, if there was more of the bar stuff, like in the voting, like that we've had this year. I mean, he had yeah. a lot of good stuff last year. Like the Hardy matches were really good. Oh yeah, um, they were great. So I mean, maybe a little bit more. He ticks ticks up and up. You know, like I think with every year that passed, he's moved up and up the list. Like I think if if we were to do this list again in five years, or four years at this point from you know last year, um, I think I think he's probably checks in higher overall. Uh, I think he's a guy that people are going to revisit. And gain an appreciation for. Again, I think there's so much fatigue of this current day that guys like him get punished for it, right? Yeah, and 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 like I'm walking, I'm watching back pay per view years now, and I find that like I'm very rarely let down by a match of his. Like right. even ones that I didn't like at the time, I look back now and I'm like, wow, that's actually really solid. Like, yeah. All right, pretty gym number thirty one. Fucking fella, yes, let's do it. <laughs> All right, this guy had a twenty-eight. You had him at fifty. Um, Fuck this guy. So this again, guy a, a shit. <laughs> another big uh, distance, and he finished thirty-four. So kind of uh, closer to me than you. He had a high vote of eight. Too high. Yeah, too high. I'll give you this, but he does have a lot of good matches on his resume. Um, yes. he is a great talker. David Carley had him at eight uh, ahead of John. Who's behind him? John Cena. John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and that is Christian. At last, he's on his own. Uh, I love Christian. When I originally did this, I thought he had a shot at, inside the top twenty. Uh, as I built that list, I, I realized that was kind of crazy. I, I knew I wanted him inside the top thirty. Um, I, I, you know, all the guys behind him may be more iconic character wise. He has the matches none of those guys have. And whether you want to lay them at his feet or not, he has all those TLCs, all the lat- all the stuff we talked about with Edge and the other guys, right? He has all those. Yeah. He also has um, the uh, stuff with RVD that I liked, right? In 03. Um, he's got the Jericho feud in 04. Which is damn good. All the stuff with Trish. He has the Orton feud, which is top notch, excellent. Uh, he's got the ECW run on TV, which I really liked, and the you know stuff with Dreamer and all that. Um, what else am I missing here? He had Orton. Did he have something else? He feud with like Del Rio or Sheamus too, or something in there. He had an awesome match with Del Rio at uh, SummerSlam 13. Oh, right. So that's what I'm thinking of. So he's got that. Um, so a guy that proved himself later, right? He went to TNA, comes back, 
broke out as a big star in 05. He's kind of the best part of the Cena Jericho three way feud, and people were just hungry, starving for him to be in the world title picture and win the title, and they never went with him. Um, I think he improved as a promo. He was probably shakier early on, um, but he got he got really good later. And I just yeah, I, I, he was one of the bright spots during a sometimes dark era of Raw, like in 02, 03, 04. Uh, he was really good then. All the stuff with Jericho. <laughs> How many years are part of that dark era? It's a Triple H run, right? Oh two, oh three, oh four. Yeah, yeah. So, But his work with like Jericho and others is all like those are bright spots during that time. Him and uh, Booker doing the the Peeperuni contest, you know, like all that stuff. Uh, his feud with Booker. Once he cuts his hair, he really becomes legitimized. Um, even the edge matches aren't great, but I think they're very good. So I I, I think he's got a lot of meat on the bone. Um, and I think he's a great worker, face or heel, tag or single. Good connection, obviously, with the fans, especially in that 05 stretch where they loved him. I, I think he's really the complete package. It's just the one thing he was missing was never really the guy. Like, I think that's what keeps him out of this top half that's coming up. Like, I think right after him, I hit the stretch of, like, everyone uh, everyone ahead of him has kind of been the guy, except for one. I have one guy in there that was never really the guy um, It's uh, for some stretch. So, to me, he's kind of the the last gasp before I hit, like, my top tier of guys. I think he's the best of the B plus guys is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, yeah. See, I don't think he hits B plus for me. And I think I- I'll give you his matches. Uh, like, again, like you said, like a lot of them are tag matches, but that's fine. He was part of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's other people you could make the case that they were the best part of those tag matches, which we will do later. Um, I just have for me, and I think I might have made this point on a pod blast about him, I never once believed him as a wrestler. I didn't ever think that he he never belonged for me where he was. He was always way above his pay grade. Like when he's fighting Orton, like the matches are great, but he's way above his pay grade. And it's it's it would always it's weird, but it would stretch my disbelief to watch those matches. And I love those matches, I think they're good. I always thought his, I'd never liked his promos. I thought he always sounded fake. Like that, I, he felt like a poor actor reading the lines for me. Mm-hmm. Like, like a lot of, and I mean, a lot of wrestlers go through that period. I think even Jericho went through that period for a while. But like, you, you, some people move out of it. He didn't for me. He always just stayed in that promo area where I didn't believe what he was saying. Um, and I just found his character, like, I didn't enjoy his character. Like, I didn't, I didn't really know who this guy was or, or what he was about. Um, he's not someone that ever attracted me to the screen. Um, nothing he did worked for me. And I thought he was a good worker. But I think a lot of his stuff, like, I think he's a much stronger tag worker. His single stuff for me, a lot of his offense for me looked weak. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't like how it connected or how it hit. I just, he never felt like a big deal for me. And I, I, I liked watching him. I like him. Like I, but I couldn't in good conscience put him ahead of where I had him. Put him ahead of the guys I had ahead of him. Like I couldn't in good conscience put him ahead of superstar Billy Graham. Mm-hmm. I know that's a weird thing to do. But it's like this was a guy who had tons of influence, who had, who had like, like he, he was a world champion. He was a tremendous promo for the time. I like, think Christian had a lot of influence too, though. I mean, I mean, like the tag division reinventing the comedy stuff, like all that stuff, like kind of ushered in that era of of you know he's a big part of like that massive two thousand for WWF. Like, I mean, they are Edge and Christian are like one of the top acts of that whole year, and he was just as good as Edge in all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't disagree that he's just as good as Edge in that stuff. I just like I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But like in twenty years, are people going to be doing stuff because of, because of, because of like would Christian be a great influence in the same way that like I think Edge and Christian as a tag team would yeah I think a lot of kids growing up in that era maybe became wrestling fans of two thousand would say like yes that blend of high flying action you know garbagey stuff plus comedy could look at them as influences I think so but I but I I see I I don't I think you're attributing too much to Edge and Christian there like. I don't think that's Edge and Christian's legacy. I think their their legacy is being the annoying characters of being the comedic characters. But they they were not the high flyers in in the same way that say the Hardys were the high flyers. Yeah, but like, I think they, they were the, take... more the hybrid of the of the three teams, right? You see, the Dudleys were pretty much brawlers. 
the Hardys or the Flyers. I thought Edge and Christian had the blend. The, I thought they had the best blend of the two, right? They could they could fly around, they could brawl, they could work the mat. Um, yeah, I, I just, think Christian I too is. I, I think I, I think the connection he had that brings him apart too is like in that stretch of that oh three oh four oh five where he was like kind of that people's champion for a lot for a lot of fans. Um, and, and like a lot of people were behind him to leave at that point, right? They were like, go to TNA, become the star you should be like, go get your shot. Um, I, I think, I think this speaks volumes to his connection with the fans is like them wanting him desperately to get that shot that they never gave him. And they tease it a lot, right? They have him win. Uh, he gets a chance against Batista and Batista pretty much just squashes him like on TV. Um, he gets, to, he gets inserted into the scene of Jericho feud. So like he's there, he's lingering. But they never quite give him the shot, and then he leaves and gets the shot, and comes back. It's almost like a modern day, like a Drew McIntyre and other guys, right, who had to leave to kind of win back the respect. And when he comes back, he's a great TV worker. He's like we've talked about Matt Hardy and others that were just great TV workers. There's a stretch where you could argue he's probably the best TV worker in the company in that oh nine ten stretch. So um, I think that speaks volumes too in a TV driven era, like we've mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, I can't discount that. I think I think just when I look at my list. What I notice is that I tend to really favor, very heavily favor. Um, I mean, I, I give credence to matches, obviously, because there are some guys that are on my list because of matches. But if you haven't created like a, a crazy, like, I tend to favor the guys that have more heartfelt moments that that create the all the all time memorable things. And I just don't see Christian in that light. I don't see those moments for him. And so for me, that hurts him on my list. All right. Like, what is his best moment? Is it winning the title, like, from Del Rio? Yeah. I mean, oh, no. I mean, maybe 20, right, where he beats Jericho and makes out with Trish. Um, oh, winning the yeah. TLC. But even then, yeah. Yeah, the TLC, but see, when I think of TLC, I don't think of him. I think of, I think of Edge getting, uh, spearing Jeff Hardy off the thing. Yeah. You know, I, I, like, it's just, he's not the one I think of. And it, it's, I'm not trying to slight him or say he's not part of the matches because obviously he's just as important. But like, he just, for me, doesn't have that iconic, like, even the things you're talking about in 2003, 2004, like, I couldn't care less if he had left in that period because I just didn't enjoy him. Like, I, th- I thought he was phony right. and fake. So, like, I mean, I think for Christian, yeah. it's a personal thing. I mean, like, like I think back to 2000 and they were like my favorite act, right? Angle, Christian Edge, and Christian right. was a big part of it. Um, so I, I just think I had that emotional connection to him that stayed. Like I loved him. He was one of my favorite guys in 02. From 2000 through 05 when he leaves, he's like one of my favorite guys. And then he comes back and is actually really great <laughs> during as a worker, right? So um, yeah, yeah, I, 28 maybe high. I don't know. You know, or maybe not. Like you're, you're. I think you're closer to what people like right. in terms of like the general populace. Right. Like I like compare him like Tito. Like you know, Tito doesn't have the matches he has. Same with Jake and DiBiase. And so those guys all have the character, which gets them up here. Whereas I thought Christian had the best for the guys that never broke through. The one guy I look at this list that I probably had lower than you know maybe could have been right here with him is like a Flair and an Owen. Right. So like those are two guys. Owen is probably actually very similar to Christian. Um. So. Looking at it, I would say, okay, maybe Owen should have been right up here with him on my list. So I, I feel like I probably had Owen low. Flair is an Owen, interesting one. But. but Owen just also had so many more memorable moments and like – Sure. But I don't think he's got just, the matches that, that Christian has. No, but but again, you're looking at a situation where like – I mean is Owen's best match better than Christian's best match? Depends how you're looking at Christian's best match. Right. Like, let's say you just take a wrestling match. Like, so not the TLC and, stuff? Yeah, I mean, the TLC stuff is probably his best stuff, right? Yeah, so what's his best match at Orton? Uh, yeah, probably. I, I, my favorite Orton is the one at Over the Limit, oh, 11. All right, so you t- take whatever the one of those Ortons you think is best against what's Owen's best, Brett at 10? Probably Brett, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I'd probably give it to Owen there, but like... Working with Bret Hart, one of the greatest of all time, versus Paul Rucker, Christian Randy Orton. Randy Orton. <laughs> One of I the mean, greatest of all time. Come on. I, I, we're going to talk about Orton soon, I would imagine. Yeah, he's coming up. Yeah, so like, I I mean, I don't think Orton's in the same category as Bret Hart, but I don't think it's as far as we like to think. Right, but I wouldn't have that match that far behind, right? I'd have it, like I have the Orton one at like four and a half and like the the Bret one at five kind of okay. thing. Yeah, so would you say that there's a half a star difference between Bret Hart and Randy Orton? Uh, come on. 
No, no, Brett. Brett's yeah, Brett's substantially better as okay. a storyteller. All right. Yeah. So there you go. Again, yeah. not discrediting it, Owen, but I'm just saying the gap isn't that the gap in their top non. You know, if you're discounting the TLCs for Christian, they're just their best straight wrestling match. It's I don't think it's that far off, but. Um, anyway, we already discussed Owen, and we've already discussed Christian. So why don't we get on to our number thirty, gentlemen? Uh, we have talked about Owen. Oh wow! Well. Oh no, we haven't. no, we haven't. I'm sorry, we have not. Yeah. So we'll talk about Owen. Um, all right, let's talk about our number thirty overall. Who uh, actually is twenty seven on both of our lists? <laughs> uh, hey. So here we go. Have we had one yet? Were we? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, Oscar was sixty five on both of ours. So this is our second wow. guy of. Uh, we got a bunch coming up, but uh, number twenty seven, and that is Jeff Hardy. And let's see where he was overall. He was at 32. So fairly close. I am an unabashed Hardy Mark um, from their work as a team and him as a single. He's always been one of my favorite guys. You talk about crowd connection through the roof. Um, Work rate improved greatly after his initial stretch. You know, he had the spot monkey Hardy stuff. And then that initial stretch. Hmm. Sput monkey. There you go. That initial stretch as a singles where he he didn't really have much psychology to his work, right? He had a little bit here and there, but a lot of it is just moves, moves, moves. Um, when he comes back in 06 is when he really develops as a worker, right? So 06 to 08 like, is his peak to me as a in-ring storyteller worker. Um, but before that, in the o, you know, 01, 02, he's got the Undertaker ladder match. Like He's got good stuff in there. Um, but the, the second run to me is where he really makes his hay, both with the tag, you know, reunited with Matt, the match with Kate and Murdoch and, uh, world's greatest tag team, Eminem, like all that stuff is great. I mean, the match with Eminem at Rumble 07, we've talked about before, maybe the best straight tag match and, you know, or one of the best straight tag matches in company history. Um, so he's got plenty there. And even this most recent run, he's got the bar cage match. You know, he's got some good stuff in there too. His matches with Umaga in 08 were, were really fun. So um, tons of moments, tons of matches, electric personality. And when I look at my list now, I say, okay, he's probably like the very bottom rung of my, like what I start to look at as elite guys. Again, I got one guy coming up that probably isn't in that. But other than that, I probably have like 26 kind of elite level guys that I look at as if I'm building a company, I'm comfortable taking any of these guys. Right. Just to, to, to like build around. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, if you have a 26 round draft, I'm okay getting Jeff Hardy at 26. That's kind of what I'm saying. Even though was, I have him at 27. I have one guy coming up. We'll talk about that. I probably overranked, but mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, look, see, he's who I think about when I think of those TLC matches, not that it wasn't a six man effort, mm-hmm. but like, it's all him. Like when you when the, the best memories of it for me are all him. Um, He's a guy who I, I didn't expect to have this high. I expected him to have him closer to when uh, around where Matt was. But then when I started putting him up against guys and seeing how big that catalog was, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's crazy. Now, let me ask you something. For the tag team thing, are you considering the Hardys as number one overall? They are on my very short list for top spot. See me too, and it's and it it really is kind of a sneaky thing. Like I don't think I would consider Edge and Christian or the Dudleys as number one. Right, but they don't all have the second run that the Hardys no, had. Yeah, that's it. But like, even looking back on that run, when they when they all started having like, I mean, you have the TLC matches where they're all excellent, but I find both of those teams, the Dudleys and Edge and Christian, have their better matches against the Hardys. For me, as much as like, I think for you, the, the Edge and Christian were the glue mm-hmm. of that little area. I think the Hardys were the glue of that thing. See, when I look uh, at those I, three teams, to me, especially once you get past WrestleMania two thousand. The Edge and Christian always felt like more of the top team of those three, and the Hardys and Dudleys felt more like tag teams. See, I, I, I would say that's just because they had the titles for most of it. Like, they were constantly the champions. Like, I, I think in terms of quality and in terms of overness, I think for me, the Hardys takes it. And, and I would actually probably argue that I think in terms of act that year, I would have the Hardys as the top act in the company hmm. ahead of Triple H even which I know is probably blasphemous to some, but I just think their, their output in that year is so strong and, and so much of it falls on him. And I also really love his work. Um, I love his work with Rob Van Dam when Van Dam first comes in. I think he's the perfect opponent for Van Dam coming in and yep. really helps Van Dam establish that character. That match invasion is, I, I love it. I think it's just tremendous. And, um, 
his main event run is really solid. Like we, you, you kind of touched on it a bit, but that ladder, that TLC with Punk is is fantastic. And I would even say his No Mercy 08 match with Triple H, yes. which he loses to Triple H, but I, I think that match is just great. Um, so yeah, he's just got nothing but good stuff. His connection's amazing. His work rate is really sloppy, but it totally works for who his character is. Right, it's supposed to be maniacal and insane and. Yeah, and the fact that he can still do it is insane. <laughs> like, I don't know how his body isn't broken to bits. And I mean, like, we don't count his TNA stuff, but like, I mean, if he decides to go all in with Matt Hardy on this fucking weird shit, like, it right. works. He's he's really good at embracing it. And I would even say if he ever got a really nice heel run, um, I think that'd be interesting too, because the heel work he did in in TNA was interesting. So I, yeah. again, it's not something we would consider, but I think the potential is there for him to even do even more interesting stuff going forward, which sure. is great. And all this stuff now is pretty much gravy for him anyway. I mean, he's, he's built his case. He's a hall of famer. Um, <clears throat> and to me, one of the 27 <laughs> best of all time, probably 26. <laughs> again, there's one I'm going to, we're going to probably argue about. All right, let's get to 29. Uh, this is a guy. We both have the same spot as well. We both had him at 26. And Woo! that is uh, the animal. Batista finished at 31 overall, high vote of 11. Uh, I, again, I think he's almost like a richer man, Sheamus, in that you may not, off the top of your head, think Batista's believable in this spot. Like, wait, Batista is a top 26 act of all time? But again, a guy, when you really dive into his case and think about what he brought to the table and what he meant, like, I, I think it's perfect. Like, I mean, you know, next to Cena, he was a top star. And I think his run in 14 really padded his case because he was so damn good, even though many people didn't want to admit it or accept it at the time, um, especially the evolution stuff is like so good. He's really good at WrestleMania 30, uh, embracing the Hollywood heel. His heel run in 09 at the 10 is just fantastic. Um, maybe one of the best you know heel stretches ever. His turn on Ray is epic. The, ma- the feud with Cena is, is just damn good. Um, and then just, you know, that promo in the wheelchair with the neck brace and all that shit. Um, and then his feud with the Undertaker at all through 07 has produced a great, great matches. The, the match at 23 is just one of the biggest shocking great matches of all time that they bust out. Uh, plus all, and we're not even counting, right? All the Triple H stuff, the Hell in a Cell, the face turn is just, you know, an all time one. And he ended up developing into a hell of a promo and presence. His character, he's just beloved through a lot of 05. And you mentioned before, like, does he cool off? But if you even watch late 05 stuff, like when he's teaming with Ray and everything, like the pops are just crazy. Like everyone just loved him. Um, right. He does but he's suffer also a bit. Smack. Yeah. Right. He is also on SmackDown, right. But when, when he comes back, he suffers a bit in 06 or whatever. When he comes back from the injury, uh, you can tell he's yeah. out of sorts. It takes him a bit. At 23 is really what jump starts him again. Yeah, well, because he's also like ending Booker T's run and shit right. like that, like like a heel, but a heel everyone kind of liked. Yeah, that late 06 is, is rough. I and mean, those matches suck. They didn't have much chemistry. Um, you almost wondered like if he lost it while he was hurt, like if it was gone, you know, like if he had his run and now he's kind of cooked, but he, he, he rediscovers it. And the Edge feud is kind of hit or miss in, in 08. I, I'd have to relive them. From what I remember them being, they were they were just kind of okay, like they never really clicked. Um, but Cena, the Cena SummerSlam match is great. I love that match. I also really like his match with Michaels, uh, yes. the stretcher match at yeah. uh, One Night Stand. Um, yeah, he, I, I would, I would probably, I would probably say that I think Sheamus is probably a better worker than Batista. I like, I like his match style more. I like his, his move set more. I, I find he's probably a bit crisper in the ring. But Batista's got intangibles just out the ass, right? Like he's so over. He's got that star quality. Um, if Sheamus had had that stuff, we'd be talking about like a, I don't know, more of an all timer than he already is, I guess. Right. <laughs> Great analysis, right there. <laughs> All right. Anything else you got on Batista? No, I mean he's great. I mean, like his his feud with Jericho is great. Like he, he he's just an all time great. And and I think if you're down on Batista, I just don't think you probably have watched. I think you're thinking you of Batista like oh four. <laughs> if you're down. Yeah. On but even in 04, he was, he was, he was fine. Like, yeah. He wasn't bad. Like, and then he did all these little cool little character things that really helped build him up. Like right. he was a master of like the little looks of the crowd and the body movements that really like would pop everybody. 
He he was he was a tremendous talent. And we talked about chance. Hammer and Beefcake before. You know, you kind of get that with Flair and Batista, like during that run. Like you could tell Batista was just like that tag run and being part of Evolution helped him so much. Like without that, I don't think he ever becomes what he becomes. I think just absorbing from Flair throughout that whole year just helped him helped it all click and come together. Uh, because you can see it as he goes through the year, you can see it coming together for him. Yeah, exactly. And and very few top guys have his range too. Like of of being like such a despicable heel, like turning right. on Mysterio, the Hollywood heel. Like there, there's just so many different facets of his character he's able to play. Yeah, no, he's great. <clears throat> if you feel like you underrated him, you should go back and and rewatch him. Um, to me, he's a guy that deserves to probably be higher than where he finished. Or where did I say he finished? Thirty. I don't remember. Thirty. Uh, hang on, one sec. I closed up accidents. Come on. Mm. Listeners count on you for these things. Uh, 31. But someone had him at 98. So, like, that person needs their life evaluated. <laughs> 98? Wow. Yeah. Someone had Jeff Hardy at 99. Someone voted Hogan at 100. So, yes, like... That's true. Uh, all right. Let's move along. Here's a contentious one, which I'm willing to admit. Again, it, the mindset I was in, the stuff I was listening to... Right. I'm fine saying I overrated him. We don't have to spend too much time on Rick Martel. I had him at 25. You had him at 71. Um, overall, <laughs> let's see where he finished overall. At 56. He had a high vote of nine, so I wasn't the craziest. Um, Good Lord. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you like him, you're, you're really basing it on like his, you know, I think, early, like you said with Valentine, early 70s, 80s face work. Uh, but I think he's so great as a tag worker, just his, his fire – um, one of the best baby face hot tags of all time when you come in with the uh, Ricky Martel stuff. You know, just come in flying and doing those kicks. Clapping, um, clapping know. his hands, dancing in place. Oh, so good. He was so good in that role with Strike Force and the Can Am connection. And I actually think he, he's really good as a heel, and the heel character is what puts him over the top. But I do think it ended up stunting him. Uh, I, he's a guy that probably deserved, I think, more something bigger as a face. Like, whether it's an icy title reign or something. Whereas the model character is super memorable, he just wasn't as crisp and exciting as a worker when he's a heel. At least at first he is, but it fades like by by ninety or so, or he settles into kind of a a, a template heel run. Um, and they kind of did nothing with him match wise when he became the model too. Right, he's got the little bumps with Tito here and there, and then he's got the blindfold stuff. Um, then yeah. you know even the Summer Sunday two match is super fun. Like we just rewatched that. Oh, with Michaels, yeah. Yeah, like that. that's a lot of fun. So when they gave him shots, like he'd still deliver, you know? Uh, he gets the bump in 93 where he fights with Razor for the title. So, But, it, it, you know, the bulk of his work all sur- surrounds his tag stuff, like whether it's with Guerrilla, with Tito, with Zenk. Like all that stuff is where his best work really comes in. So, again, I think the mindset I was in at the time, what I was watching and listening to, like Tag Team's Back Again, his feud with the Islanders, like all that stuff I think was in my head when I put him here. Again, I'd probably have him down in that clump with the perfect trip. Like, I'd probably have him like early 40s. Like, if I look at him versus like a Razor Ramon, you know, I look at it now and say, okay, I probably should have had a Razor a little bit higher um, than Martel. So I'd, I'd probably put him in the low 30s, 40s. So again, he's the outlier for me in this group where I have the guys I'm calling like my elite. He kind of snuck in where he shouldn't have. Um, but he fits well with that perfect group because he's, again, a guy whose best work is probably AWA outside of this um, where he was his biggest. So all those other guys had their best work outside of WWF and he fits. So Jeff Hardy, Batista take out Martel and on is like where I look at my kind of top level guys and, and Martel just kind of, he, he backed in there and again, probably higher than I'd have him now. <laughs> now it's going to be interesting with Martel and the tag teams. Yes. Is I wonder if any of his tag teams are actually going to finish super high. Right. Because as much as he's a tremendous tag worker, like how many of those teams really had a massive lasting impact? Like right. I know I love Strike Force, but like they're really only a team for like six months or whatever, or maybe a little longer. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how guys like him, like Goldust, like how they fare. See, I they think tag pop- teams like that are gonna because I think the the depth isn't there. So I think if you have a short run, it's not gonna hurt you as much as a tag team as it did as a singles. Because I think I think there's very few tag teams that have like super long runs in the WWF. Right. Um, there's some, but there's not not a ton. But I'm curious if you'll have a Rick Martel tag team in your top 25. Strike Force may sniff. 
Mm. I don't know though. I haven't really started piecing together the list yet, so I haven't I haven't thought yeah. it through. But yeah, I mean, look, I Rick Martel's great, but I wouldn't put him that high. Yeah, <laughs> that's... no, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about him or no? You don't have to. No, he's an, he's an arrogant man. Let's move on. Okay, you're an arrogant man. All right, our number twenty-seven. We've mentioned him a few times here today. I had him at thirty-seven. You have him at twenty-five, and that is the Nature Boy. Rick Flair, who finished Woo! overall at 23, so actually higher than either. Someone had him at two. Uh, two. He was kind of a lightning rod in this project um, because I think people kept feeling like, well, if you're not counting his other stuff, then he's not that good, right? And not really, I think, taking the time yeah. to understand. Like, someone had him at 88 as a low. Like, I mean, like, I think if you have him there, you're not really thinking about what he brings to the table in his WF run. You're just assuming you're overcorrecting. And I think Nate and Scott kind of talked about that on there show when they did flair um they were kind of doing the well if you're discounting you know if you have to take out his wcw stuff then he's just not as high which i think is crap because i think you're overlooking all the real damn fucking good stuff he had um in the wf so i wanted to see who had him at 88 it might have been nate because i remember he had him pretty low yeah uh let me see might have had mabel ahead of him no henry rivers had him at 88 um, I'll try and find Nate's list. I know he had him. He had him kind of low because I remember that being a talking point on their show. But brother Milton, we're gonna fire some shots. Brother Nate. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I'll, f- I'll find him. Go ahead. Talk about Flair. Oh, I mean, look, I I, I have him at twenty five. I, I think if I were to reevaluate, maybe that's too high. I'm not sure. But his moments are just – I mean I keep mm-hmm. saying these things, but his moments are just so phenomenal right from the moment he comes into the company. I mean that whole year and a half is is an all-time year for anyone. And I don't want to say just in the ring because, I mean, he's not – he doesn't have that many tremendous matches or whatever. But, I mean, that Royal Rumble – 75, one spot ahead of Charlotte. Wow. Who's, who's one spot ahead of him? Funk. Which is crazy. I mean, I had Funk High, but I, I mean, how do you have yeah, like, Flair? He has MVP like, ahead of Flair, like Haystacks Calhoun, <laughs> um, yeah. Mike Rotundo ahead of Flair, Bob Orton, Jim Neidhart ahead of Flair. No, no. Neidhart. That means that uh, money is ahead of Flair. Ken Kennedy, um, like, 30, like 20 spots ahead of Flair. Right. <laughs> he also has Daniel Bryan at 55, so I think we have to dismiss Nate, Brother Nate's list. Brother <laughs> Nate. Sorry, Brother Nate. Brother Nate, damn it. <laughs> Thought we were friends. <laughs> Um, no, um, so look, that Royal Rumble moment is one, arguably the greatest Rumble performance in company history. One of the greatest performances, period, in company history. I would also, I'll go on record saying too that I think that, um, the match with Randy Savage at WrestleMania 8 is, um, is a, for me, a five star match. I, I, I love every ounce of that match. I think the emotions there, um, I think Ric Flair is perfect in that match, and he's the perfect foil for Savage, and they, they just make magic together. And then the rest of the year, he's 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 in the mix. Every storyline runs through him. He's consistently interesting. He bleeds over so much that the commentary becomes better because of him. Right. And then he's got the um, he's got the departure in '93 with Perfect, which is also very good. And I think I think where people get lost a bit on Flair is is when he comes back. He's not the flair of old, and I think a lot of people find that disappointing. Right. But he, but he's still really good. Yeah, like there's he's a ton still, of good stuff in there. Yeah, he's got so much good stuff. And did he wrestle too long? Probably. But, like, I mean, he's got the match with Vince, which is excellent. The match with Undertaker, which is excellent. The match with Austin on Raw mm-hmm. is very good, too. Um, the later matches with Triple H, not so much. Uh, but he's got matches with Michaels that are good. Well, the 05 ones are good. Oh, the all five ones yeah. are great. I'm talking more about. I was I was thinking chronologically, like you oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, match with Jericho is okay. Like he, he's just not the Ric Flair of old. But then, I mean, he could never be. And and so even even in his diminished state, he was still very good. He's having bloodbaths with Mick Foley. You know, he's he's getting killed by Umaga, helping him get over. Right. He's winning the Intercontinental from Carlito in a cool moment. Um, and then the retirement angle is tremendous. Mm-hmm. He's fantastic in it. So as much as I think 25 might be a bit high, I don't think it's 
so yeah, high. And he, and he still had the promo skills. He had the character. He's the face. He's, I mean, he's got all those intangibles. Don't go away. I mean, he, those were all great during <laughs> during the stretch that he had. Yeah. Um. So if you're dinging him, it's on this misconception that you, you're conceiving that he didn't have a long run. Oh well, you know, he was. If we're not counting WCW, it's not. But it's still a long, long run. He's got the basically a year and a half at, at the top. And then he's gone from 01 to 08. Like that's, you know, he's got like almost 10 years of active wrestling. Like that's, that's more than a lot of guys on this list. That's like three times more than fucking Rick, Rick Root. <laughs> yeah, way, yeah. Yeah. You know, how many, way more than funk, you know, it's not even close. That's funk. <laughs> but I mean, but a lot of these guys. So, I mean, to, to act like, because you're discounting WCW that like his resume falls apart is crazy. He's still got 10 quality years. And, the stretch you may think about is maybe that like o two o three where like Rico and all that shit. But I mean, if you get past that, like he's got the stuff with Edge, which is really good, the TLC match, and then yeah, you get his you know uh, fucking Randy the Ram o <laughs> six, where yeah. he's just having like these crazy fucking matches. Um, he's a know, transfusion after every match, right? Him and Big Show in that ECW bloodbath, and mm. you know Money in the Bank where he takes a nasty bump. Uh, but even the evolution stuff we talked about, remember they were having all those six mans on Raw and stuff, right? Where like those are like anchor matches on on Raw during a lot of eight, six and eight men, and he's in all those. So um, no, I'm a Flair fan when it comes to WF. I think he's I think he was underrated in this project. Well, actually, he finished kind of high, I guess overall. But I think I, I think people they were giving the opinions were underrating him. I think he, he finished high in the back of probably a bunch of people having him here. But then I think he also probably had a bunch in the back end of people overlooking him. So I don't know how much it would have raised him overall, but um, I, I think he deserves – his average rank was 34. So um, he finished 23 based on the point. So that tells you what. A lot of people had him high. So, But a lot of people mm. had him low. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, it was a weird thing watching that develop. Yeah. Like you're not – like look, with Terry Funk, I get it. Like I can, I can see the argument there because like – I just don't think his longevity is enough, you know? Not that he doesn't have any, but at least the argument's more plausible. Like, Flair, like you said, has 10 years. More than Mr. Perfect, more than uh, more than Owen Hart, right? Like, Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I really don't see the case for having him outside the top 30, at the very least. But I just don't, I don't see how you can look at these other guys and say they're better than Flair's WF career. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, I, I think, think you're almost but, punishing him for being so great in WCW. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? But I okay. would argue his last run in WF is it may be better than his last, like, six years in WCW from, like, 94, nine, like, or 95 on to 2001. Like, I think his 02 to 08 is better. Yeah, I I, I don't wouldn't see much of an argument with that. Like, he, he does nothing the last few years. Right. I mean, he fights the NWO, but... No one came out looking. No, and Chad and I that. have talked about that on, on our Warzone podcast. Like we're tr- kind of track. Like when is he? When is his peak over? Chad thinks it's the end of ninety five. I think it's actually mid ninety six. But um, either way, you still get another five years there, almost of him not being on his ga- top of his game. And if you, so, my point is: is his WCW run really that much longer? Maybe a little bit, but to discount it like it was three decades and WF as a year, <laughs> like that's what, that's how yeah. some people were justifying where they had it, which I think is crap. Yeah, and 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 then how do you how do you rate that year? That even if you just were to say that right. year, like that's one of the best years anyone's ever had, like in terms of being so dominant on the show and and producing that kind of quality. Yeah, like no, I don't get it. Haters, haters gonna hate. Haters gonna hate. Hate. hate haters hate. gonna take. Gotta shake, 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 shake it off. I just shake it off. All right, number twenty six. Uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> 26 is probably one of my last, I think, in my mind, contentious elite level guys. I think everyone else from my 23 on is like, most people would say, okay, those are probably top 23 guys, Um, at least argument-wise. But I think this guy deserves to be up there. You have him at 38. I am at 24. Let's see where he finished overall at 33. High vote of 10, and that's Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, All-time epic feud with the Iron Sheik. One of the best dudes of the 80s. One of the best matches of the 80s. Um, iconic <laughs> character. Crossed over. Became a, you know, big toy star. <laughs> whatever, big cartoon star. Uh, All time th- epic feud with Serpentor. Yes. And then I think his 91 run is become underrated. Um, 
I think he's excellent in that role as the heel. I think it people look sour on it because, you know, the morality of <laughs> taking, you know, picking on the jingoistic nature of the war, I think, ter- you know, turned some stomachs the wrong way. But when you look at the work he did, just him, if you understand that he was pushed into the role probably, um, or at least, you know, like, would you turn that down if they offered you that chance to, to, at that age to become a main eventer? Um, probably not. And I think his work is exceptional. Like, that WrestleMania 7 match is, is fucking really did, damn good, if not great. Uh, his match, his him beating the Warrior, the Heat on that moment, just everything. The, the Desert Storm match with Hogan at MSG. Um, just a whole ramp up. All his promo, his promos from, like, right before the rumble till mania are just like next level stuff that he's doing every week. All the Saddam Hussein shit and my rules, slaughter rules, like just all that stuff is so good. Um, I know it felt anticlimactic at the time because the odds of him beating Hogan at mania were, were none, but he, he gives it a go. I mean, he is really good. And again, this is just focusing on his late era, not even all the great stuff he did like in the early eighties with Pat Patterson and the alley fight there. Another great moment. So like, he's got the matches to me. He's got the, the chic match, the Patterson match, the Hogan match, like those are three, you know, I, I know some people have the, those matches at five, like the alley fight and the, and the Sheik match and stuff. So, yeah. um, he's got the match. He's got the character face heel, uh, great promo. I think he's got a, a case. Like to me, he, he could have been the guy, you know what I mean? He's a guy that if I would have probably watched more of, um, I he probably would have higher. Cause every time I watch something with him, I put him higher on the list. Right. You should also check out his backland stuff if you haven't seen it. I, I quite enjoyed their Yeah, feud. that too. Yep. Uh, where like uh, I think he whipped backland and then backland lost it and they had this crazy brawl. Yes. Um, yeah, he, he's just a great all-around package. And uh, I mean, giant chin. We're not going <laughs> to – we can't – I mean, we have to talk about it. <laughs> giant chin, giant head, um, but a giant heart. And literally, that he shrunk when he got thinner. <laughs> um, but I don't want to discount too, like even his comeback in like '97 as commissioner. Um, it's fine. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's got the match with Triple H and all that. He's very active and with DX, like all that stuff was pretty good. He's got the real late bump, in like what '06 or whatever. He comes back a few times, but he'd always come back here and there. Fights a legend killer and you know does a lot of stuff. So almost wins the gimmick battle. <laughs> yes, almost. He should have so- won. Iron Sheik just couldn't take the bump. Yeah, <laughs> it couldn't send the fans home happy. But no, I love Sarge. Um, I, I think again, if he's overlooked, it's due to the fact that you're probably just thinking, oh, ninety one, he was fat, old, and like not maybe didn't dig into the older stuff. But I don't know how you can discount what he brought to the table. No, ninety one is good, and his bumping is still good in ninety one. Oh, yeah. I mean, someone had him in ninety four. Like, how do you have Sergeant Slaughter in ninety four on a WWF it's, only list? They haven't watched it. Like I, I don't see what I don't see what you could have watched to, to put it there. Like, and it, right. if you did watch it, please write us and tell us. Like, that's not a I'm not trying to slight you by saying right. that. I'm actually legitimately curious. Like, what did you see that we didn't see? Yeah, it would put him. So I would. I, I'm assuming that it's you just haven't seen the early stuff. Uh, right. Yeah, that, that would be a pretty good hypothesis to uh, put into because, place like, there. Because, like, as much as we like the '91 stuff, I can see someone watching it and not really liking it. Sure. Yeah. Old fat jingoistic. Not into yeah. the story. Fine, I get it. But then, yeah, you know, look, yeah. So if you're just basing it on that, so it was uh, Jason Fascade um, had him at 94. So I am curious. He had Sting at 95. So you think Sting had yeah. the same career, basically? So I just lowered the day off. Yes, Finn Balor and the Bushwhackers ahead of him as well. So and DDP. Bush, ahead of him. Wait, wait, the Bushwhackers, yes. Luke and Butch, both. Is DDP at 88? Which, I, I mean, did DDP have more than, like, a dozen matches? The day? I don't even know. Um, well, I don't know. How long was he stalking Sarah Undertaker for? Yeah, so, anyway. Again, we're not dismissing this. We're just questioning, like, you know, how, basically, do we get to this point? Um, yeah. Jamie Noble at 79. So, stuff like that. Um, well, Jamie Noble did bang Nidia. True. Who did Sergeant Slaughter bang? China, probably. Rock, Rock and Robin. In 97. <laughs> uh All right, so uh, why don't we end here, Aaron? We, we're going to get over two hours in. We've actually worked, we hacked off a lot of this list. We started at number 41. We're ending at number 26. So we did a good 15 here tonight, um, which is good for that's us. That's good for us. Yes, that's, that's very really good, good for us. Um, the next guy on our list, number 25, uh, so we're hitting our cumulative top 25, uh, is going to be a discussion. So we're going to hold that for the next time. Um, but it's been fun talking to you again. I've enjoyed it. Me too, you know? 
We should talk about who Sergeant Slaughter bangs more often. Yeah, we should. I want to bang Sergeant Slaughter. Who doesn't? You don't? Would you? Would you shine his head up? I would attempt. Nice. Okay. Why don't we go? Uh, we'll be back soon, hopefully sooner than the last time, because we, we need to get to this last 25. So we will try and get you our top 25 soon. For now, enjoy this, and listen to all the other shows at PlaceMation.com. Be sure to join the greatest WD tag team project ever. Discussions ongoing on the Facebook page. We're going to be ramping up, I'm sure, with content soon as well. This is around when we started last year. So. Uh, all that said, that's Aaron. I'm JT. We're out. Goodbye. We made it. Uh, I'm to see you.